Well, the, the time being uh, 5 p.m., I'll bring to order the May 6, 2020 regular meeting of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Uh, I'll ask the secretary to please call the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Hassan. Here. Commissioner Severson. Present. Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner French. Commissioner French. Commissioner Forney. Here. Vice President Vita. Present. President Cogill. Here. You have a quorum. Did you not get mine? I was trying to figure it, but. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Commissioner Bourne. Here. Commissioner French. Senator Cogill, you have a quorum. Thank you, Secretary Ringgold. Uh, at this time, I'd ask for a motion to approve the agenda. Move. Second. The agenda has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on the approval of the agenda. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. The agenda has carries. Um, uh, next, I'll ask for an approval of the minutes. Uh, we have four uh, different sets of minutes to approve, including uh, the minutes of Thursday, January the 2nd, Wednesday, January the 8th, Wednesday, January the 22nd, and Wednesday, April the 22nd, 2020. Do I have a motion? A motion. Second. A, there's been a motion and then a second. Is there any dis discussion? Commissioner Meyer? President Cogo. Yep. Yeah, I brought up um, something to Secretary Ringgold just before this meeting for the January 22nd meeting. I think uh, the part about 2019-426 needs review because it doesn't make sense the way it's written out right there to me. So I would um, amend the motion to remove January 22nd at this time. Uh, okay, uh, with no objection, we'll uh, allow that as a friendly amendment. Um, we'll remove the pink, moving the minutes of Wednesday, the January the 22nd, 2020. Unless I hear any objection. Hear any objection. Hearing none, uh, we'll move forward with um, uh, a vote to approve the minutes for Thursday, January the 2nd, January the 8th, and April the 22nd. Will the secretary please take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have nine ayes. 
the approval of the minutes for those three meetings carries. Uh, moving on, uh, we have reports of officers for Superintendent Bangora. I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, President Cogill uh, and commissioners. Um, good to see everybody. Um, I'll wait till this comes up. Hopefully it goes through this time. We get some great photos. Wonderful. Uh, so I'll start with uh, the first, I'm sorry? Okay. I'll start with the first um, uh, slider on forestry. Uh, as a way of maintaining uh, social distancing guidelines, the forestry department has rented 10 utility track vehicles for arborists to use during tree planting. By planting trees at one time, one at a time, the interaction between arborists have been uh, greatly reduced. Asset management and maintenance. Maintenance staff have been working on several initiatives to help park users with social distancing. Uh, guidelines including installing hygiene stations, removing tennis court nets, closing basketball courts, placing signage reminders, uh, reminding users of distancing guidelines, installing uh, sharps containers along with regular ongoing maintenance and activities. Um, okay, pitch of the basketball room. I'm sorry, someone asked a question, I'm sorry. Oh, please continue, Superintendent. Okay. Uh, just a reminder to sorry, folks to please, to please mute themselves if they're not speaking, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so next thing we have is pictures of basketball rim closures with rims covers, the Willard Hygiene Station, uh, the, Sh the Sharps Collection Station, uh, yep, right there. And those are um, some examples of uh, what we are doing out in the community. Um, and then pictures of uh, staff working to close Cleveland Park Playground tennis courts closures at North Commons as we're working through some of the closures of our park amenities. Um, Weber Pool, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board MPRB announced on April 2nd that Weber Natural Swimming Pool and all other outdoor aquatic facilities will be closed this summer. Despite the closure, many, many may notice the, pools, the pool is filled and water is circulating through the season. Uh, this measure is necessary to prevent damaged pool liner from heat and UV exposure. Signage on the pool fence and entry doors will indicate that the pool is closed and there will be uh, a gov delivery and communications will be uh, informing neighborhood groups and the community in the coming days. We appreciate the public's understanding these measures are necessary during difficult times. Environmental management boat launches opened for the season. We are happy to announce the public boat launches at Bede Makaska, Lake Harriet, and Lake Nokomis open for the season on Friday, May 1st. NPRB staff will perform aquatic evasive species inspections uh, of all watercraft and water-related equipment that enter and exit the lake through the boat launches from 6 o'clock a.m. to 10 o'clock p.m., seven days per week. Staff also serve as a customer service and information resource at the lakes while on duty and chains will be closed over the boat ramps at times when MPRB inspectors are not on site. It's great to see them out there uh, as I was going on the lake, so it's uh, good to see them out there. Um, so the community garden update. So 73 previously empty raised beds filled with soil and compost at Loring and Towerside Parks. Thank you to gardeners and MEOs for assisting uh, together, we moved more than 75 cubic yards of soil. Application process completed for the 2020 season. 186 gardeners applied for plots. 93 garden beds are available. Uh, working to, we're also working to increase the capacity in 2021. COVID-19 safety precautions put into place to allow socially distanced community gardening um, at all four MPRB community garden sites. So planning, North Mississippi Regional Park update. Construction work has begun at North Mississippi Regional Park for the Nature Play and Nature Ninja Trail. Uh, the project should be completed by the end of May. Parks for All Community Advisory Committee uh, on the fourth meeting on May 12th. Uh, Parks for All is a Minneapolis Parks Recreation Board's comprehensive planning process which will set NPRB priorities and policy directions for the next decade. The fourth meeting of the Parks for All Community Advisory Committee, CAC, uh, will be held online via Zoom on Tuesday, May 12, 2020, 
from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock p.m. At the meeting, the CAC will participate in a park policy recommendation drafting session. Also make sure to put the Parks for All Virtual Park Summit on your calendar. It's scheduled for May 26th uh, and June 1st, 2020. More information on the Park Summit will be shared soon. Uh, all CAC meetings are free and open to the public. Uh, the meeting link is open to the public also. Falwell Park additional improvements. Uh, work on additional improvements is underway for Falwell Park uh, after Park Board approval of the construction contract on March 14th. The improvements include rehabilitation of the tennis courts, path connecting the courts, the playground installed last fall, and the recreation center. Lighting uh, for the West Athletic Field will all be taking place at Falwell Park. Recreation. Athletic facility permits. Permits began uh, taking fall applications for Minneapolis public schools, charter schools, and private schools with the hope that we'll be able to resume play this fall. Golf. Golf is up 80, 800 rounds played from 2019 as of April 30th. All five 18 hole courses in Worth Part 3 are now open and our driving ranges at Columbia and Hiawatha. Growth driving range and Fort Stanley will be opening as soon as possible. Uh, so far, revenue has been $112,000 in revenue over the last week. Recreation centers and programs. The virtual and social distancing program team is working on the development of virtual programming and the transformation of summer programs offerings into social distance appropriate programming. With more social distancing programming, rolling out after the stay at home uh, order is lifted. Currently recreation centers is offering 17 virtual op options with more to roll out in the upcoming weeks. The majority of the program recreation center um, staff are working primarily in the ambassador program, encouraging proper social distancing behavior in the parks and tracking attendance and use. Uh, youth engagement. Research is being done on expanding the program development model to include social distancing and best practices for staff. Uh, work is being done to ignite after school uh, to learn more about how organizations are handling uh, the changes um, for their programs. And the last thing for update that I just received today is that um, Red and Pickle and Sea Salt will be opening on May 15th. Sandcastle is, um, I believe, shooting for June 3rd, and we're still uh, looking for options for Lola's. So it's really great news um, of our concessions. So with that, President Colgill and Commissioners, uh, that's all I have for Report of Officers. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Van Gora. Uh, Commissioner French has his hand raised. Commissioner French. How you doing, Superintendent uh, Van Gora? Uh, uh, question, uh, I, I noticed uh, that St. Paul is reevaluating the closure of their basketball courts. Are we in, are we in discussion right now about doing the same or are we, are we talking to folks in St. Paul to figure out how they come to that decision or? Yes, uh, President Colgo, Commissioner French, we are. We've been in contact with St. Paul ever since this uh, uh, pandemic has began. So I've been in, in contact with Mike Hom and of course our team, our recreation team has been in contact with the recreation department. We have been working in conjunction the whole time. Uh, St. Paul Park and Recreation uh, closed their facilities before we did. Um, and we tried again working with our ambassador program to do uh, do your park campaign to work with our um, with our residents um, and, and so we are aligned we're working together uh, we are also working on the same programs we will have more discussion in the COVID-19 update what we'll be giving you shortly uh, through the agenda so yes we are in, we are in talk with them uh, we know their plans they've been sharing back and forth their um, their plans to open and what they've been doing. We're taking that as best practices. We're hearing what their uh, challenges are and what their successes are, and we are doing the same thing. So we will be, uh, we will be moving forward, and we will share that in our report. Do do we know how how they came how we how they came to the conclusion to open uh, the courts back up? How did they how did they reach that decision? Did, did, what did they take in account? A lot of it was really through community response. I think there was, from what I understand, and I don't know the exact uh, time frame of it, but there was a lot of community response about opening back up the parks. And so I know the mayor, um, you know, he had um, obviously a lot of input and he had a lot of responses from the community. 
And so Park and Recreation responded to those concerns and those needs uh, as we are doing the same thing. So it really was just looking at best ways. Again, they were looking at the volume of people that were congregating or being out in basketball courts, on the fields, uh, on their playground. So they started again early with the closures of their facilities. And now they're working back uh, to see how they can address the concerns or the needs. But again, with the fact of social distancing, not opening them up and just saying, again, go back to what the concerns were, but how do we then uh, engage community in uh, social distancing practice? And what do those programs look like? Again, we will share that again in our report uh, yeah. for what we're doing and how we're going forward. I'm just real curious of the criteria that they, they might have used uh, to make that decision. Uh, and the last question uh, uh, is, I, 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 took a, I took a stroll through PV Park the other day, and I noticed that there's hand washing stations, but the, the hand washing station is nowhere near where all the people are at. And it seems like people would have to walk, a, not a great distance, but across the park. And I, I, I'm trying to figure out why it's so far away from where all the people are, are, are dwelling, or, or is that intentional or not? Yeah, I don't know exactly. Uh, I'm sorry, President uh, Cogill and Commissioner French. I'm not exactly sure of the location placement, but I do know that um, Assistant Superintendent uh, Jeremy uh, uh, Barrett um, and his team have worked with the city and worked with um, uh, the organizations to place it in the best site. Um, so I know that there was work that was done behind that. And again, I can defer to, um, to Jeremy and his team of why it was placed where it was, but I do know that the from a site perspective, I knew they were working with the city and with um, our partners to place it in the best location uh, based on sort of a, um, a a working together to see where the best place would be. Again, I can defer to um, uh, uh, Jeremy for further information on that. Uh, and we can also do that during the report of, uh, during the COVID report, but if Jeremy could respond, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, President Kogel, Commissioner French. Yeah, uh, Superintendent has it exactly right. The team worked with the City Health Department um, in citing the hand washing station. Uh, factors such as access for the, the service vehicles play into that. Um, I've not exact, I'd have to look through the emails here to see uh, or, or reach out to find out what specifically and how they landed, where they landed at PV, but. Um, it was, yes, done in conjunction, the crew leader for the service area, working with the city who and the vendor to determine what's best for servicing and just general flow and traffic uh, in the park. Uh, okay. The I, I only reason, reason I ask that is because I've literally seen an area in the park where there's, you know, 20 or 30 people, and then I walk by the hand washing station where there's no one. And so I just, I just you know, I want to make sure that it's actually being used for the purposes that is out there. So I would love to be able to reevaluate the placement of that, especially at PV. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, President Cogo. Thank you, uh, Commissioner French. Uh, Commissioner Severson. Uh, thank you, President Cogo. Uh, so uh, the park board and the city has identified issues with people not social distancing on our athletic fields and basketball courts. Uh, what is the solution and what have you guys uh, done for the people that are not social distancing on our parkways and around the lakes in the falls? Um, President Cogill, uh, Commissioner Severson, we do have a report that we're going to walk through all that. Would it be appropriate to wait till that time to give the full report or, um, or would, we do have a report that can give context behind not only what we're doing and working uh, towards um, the social distancing concerns that are around um, our, our facilities, but we can give that report during the COVID-19 report. Would that be more appropriate or do you wanna uh, take the time now to go through? We have it all in our report, I should say, so I'd like to be able to, we can spend the time through all of that as we give more context behind uh, the work that's being done and how we're responding to that. Would that be appropriate? Yeah, that's fine. I just, I just wanna have this broader conversation yeah. around uh, if we're being biased to a particular uh, culture and we're not being biased to another. Thank you. You're welcome, yes. And, and, and Commissioner uh, um, Severson, we can give a full context around that. We also do have uh, uh, some guests with us today from the health department, um, and um, uh, we can also give more information of why we did what we did. We can give uh, more context behind that and what we're doing to make sure that we are responding uh, not only to the concerns of virus and 
and what it means uh, to the people in the city of Minneapolis here in the state, but we can also then give an understanding of, of uh, specific guidelines around not only trails and use of trails, also the amenities that we have through our park system. So we can give that update as we walk through it, and we'll walk through step by step, and we can have a, uh, a broad discussion around that. Thanks, I look forward to it. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Severson. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, I had some questions about our hand washing stations as well. Uh, in particular, the locations in the location in the Whittier neighborhood. It's uh, my understanding after talking to the Whittier neighborhood director, there has been, so we have a Mueller Park open as a uh, restroom and a hand washing station, but um, Whittier Park also has some exterior access to bathrooms where we wouldn't have to open the rec center. Um, I'm just wondering what, um, and Whittier is considerably more strategically located to some of the um, highest concentrations of homeless and highly mobile within the Whittier neighborhood right now. I'm just wondering if staff had any of those conversations about relocating, either relocating that hygiene station to Whittier, or to Whittier Park or, um, or adding a hygiene station at Whittier Park. Commissioner uh, Bourne, I can Cole maybe Cole. start with that. I did have conversation with, uh, and then I'll turn it over to the superintendent if that's okay. I just want to state okay. uh, um, I've had conversations uh, the last couple of days with the executive director, uh, Ms. Brown, uh, at the Neighborhood Association, as well as um, with the council president's office uh, around coordinating that. Um, and uh, I, I, at this point, be looking with to coordinate with staff on whether or not we would open the additional space, if that's possible, or consider a, a, a move to that spot. But that is uh, in, in process. And I don't know, if Superintendent, if you have anything to add. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, President uh, Cogill and Commissioner Bourne. Um, what I could do is, uh, I know that there's been questions around that. What I could do is also, again, with uh, Assistant Superintendent Barrick, uh, Jer Jeremy Barrick, uh, can give more context behind that, too. Um, so I would turn over to you, um, Jeremy, if you have anything you want to add or any um, input that you've had from uh, the partners we've been working with on locations, and uh, uh, if you gave me any more information, I'd appreciate it. Sure, uh, President Cogill, Commissioner Bourne, um, Superintendent. Uh, we, I don't recall any conversations about Whittier. Um, I do, what I can add is that when we were looking for which restroom facilities we wanted to open as hygiene stations, we um, wanted to open independent standalone buildings that were um, only bathrooms. And so the four sites that we selected um, were just that. So understanding that some of the rec centers have exterior access to the bathroom, um, we wanted to just separate uh, the bathroom facilities out entirely and go with the independent exterior buildings. Um, we do have, we, we, you know, the bathroom conversation continues, everything from, you know, staff access to bathroom, um, and, and then, you know, with concessions coming online. Um, so we're, we fully expect to be evaluating the bathroom situation continuously here as we gain um, knowledge and gauge our capacity with 60 to 70 percent of staff reporting. Um, and then the variation and use of each of these facilities, uh, which will drive the the cleaning regime, as you know, advised by the health department, how often do we need to be cleaning? So we can look at Whittier um, again. The original intent with the hygiene stations, the park board hygiene stations, we wanted facilities that were standalone bathroom buildings, um, and you know, we can look at that. Uh, we can look at Whittier for for down the road here. Uh, thank you. The, um, I have one more question, but I'll just say, I mean, the, the Mueller location just doesn't seem to be working for anybody. Uh, and we should be 
doing what we can to deploy some resources a little bit closer to the um, to the 35W Stevens encampment. Um, do we still have, I'm not sure if this is a good question for Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, and I'm guessing we probably can't answer it today, but um, we had a, had and I believe still have a permanent easement uh, on MnDOT land for the um, for the 28th Avenue tot lot, and I, I'd just be curious as to what our rights are during um, during construction during the project construction there. And I know we have plans to go back in after the construction is over, um, but I, there just seems to be a. a failure at all levels of government right now to be responding uh, in a humane way to the human beings that are inhabiting the encampment on Stevens Avenue as well as the folks in and around the neighborhood that are fortunate enough to live in houses. And I'm wondering if, if there's no other body of government that is going to be um, stepping up to provide some sanitation for folks around there. If the Minneapolis Park Board still has some easement rights. Uh, what we can do to put a couple of hand washing stations and porta potties there, and so, I, again, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, I'm guessing you probably don't know that off the top of your head, but if we can take a look at our access rights during the construction and see if there's a way to think creatively, if no other body of government is going to be stepping up here, that that would be fantastic. President Kogel, uh, Commissioner Bourne. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, but we will check on it and we will report back. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Superintendent, for uh, that report. Um, we have uh, about three uh, minutes here uh, ahead of open time and then we do have a time certain public hearing at 545. Um, I will see if we can't uh, move our consent agenda so I will uh, ask uh, for uh, a motion on resolutions 2020-192 through resolution 2020-198. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. A motion and a second on the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on the consent agenda. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have nine ayes. Thank you. Uh, that uh, consent agenda carries. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to have us wait uh, here uh, before uh, our additional um, discussion items. Um, and I will uh, at this time move into uh, an overview of open time. Um, so during this COVID-19 period, we are adhering to social distancing recommendations. Um, as we're all aware, this meeting is being held virtually. Um, and uh, all uh, the, the public was able to submit open time comments um, uh, via email, um, which the secretary will read. We do have a total of uh, 18 uh, speakers for open time. And um, we will uh, uh, allow for uh, 90 seconds of uh, testimony and um, 
also with the acknowledgement that we will have to stop at 545 for the time certain public hearing, though at this time I'm not seeing any uh, buddy signed up to speak at that public hearing. Uh, but the time being 5.30, um, I will uh, turn it over to Secretary Ringgold. We do not have anybody here at Park Board Headquarters to speak. Um, so the first person uh, signed up to speak uh, is Lisa Lundberg. Excuse me, um, President Cogill, I'm struggling to get the time to reset to 90 seconds, so just one second. That would be lovely. Actually, I just, so I just sorted it out. Okay. Thank you. Keep the LH uh, Parkway closed to traffic as the warmer months arrive here. More and more people will want to be out and the people who live here in the neighborhood do not feel safe. We cannot keep a safe distance with others when we are, in, when we are out enjoying our neighborhood. If people want to drive, let them drive around the Minnehaha Parkway and River Roads. LH has another road that lets traffic progress around the lake, so closing it for pedestrians just makes sense and logical. You do not need to drive on it to see the lake. We must be able to keep a safe distance, especially during these warmer months. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jody Davis. I am reaching out to each of you in hopes that my voice will be heard about the serious safety issue. As you are all aware, the River Road or the River Parkway between 4th Avenue North and Portland Avenue has been closed to vehicle traffic in order to help residents adhere to the social distancing guidelines during this deadly pandemic outbreak. I am a resident of the Renaissance on the River townhouse complex located between River Parkway and 1st Street North in the North Loop. I am a senior citizen that has been isolated since the beginning of March 2020 due to my age and the high risk and high risk health issues. The only time I leave my home is to walk my small dog for exercise in the North Loop. I wear a mask and adhere to all social distancing guidelines. I live alone and have not visited with my gr children or grandchildren in nearly three months. I was delighted that you opened the parkway to pedestrian traffic as this helped me keep six feet of separation from other people. I am writing to you today after several extremely upsetting episodes with the bikers who are illegally using the parkway and disregarding the signage that says for pedestrians only. It is upsetting to me and emotionally disturbing, not to mention dangerous as several of these bikers race past me at 20 plus miles per hour when I tell them they should not be on the parkway. They give me a profane sign and or swear at me in the righteous a uh, holier-than-thou attitude. I am somewhat hard of hearing and don't always hear the bikers come up behind me. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sam Peters. I'm a Minneapolis resident in District 1 and I write to you to voice my support for continued parkway openings to non-motorized traffic. I have really enjoyed having more space outside without the anxiety of car traffic. It does not cost over $100,000 to let people walk on the parkway. Rather, it costs this much to set up 20 miles of cones to allow drivers to drive alongside people enjoying the parks. Closing off the parkways entirely to car traffic save a significant amount of money while giving more park space to people using the parks. I ask that the park board keeps the parkway openings through at least June and closes them entirely to cars to save money. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Our next speaker is Jim Young. It is in these troubling times like these that we realize how important our great park system is to us and how much we miss it when we can no longer use it. 
This has become readily apparent in the last week as all the tennis courts have been closed. While we all understand the imperatives related to the COVID-19 pandemic that brought on the closures, I believe that some changes we should be able to reopen with some changes, we should be able to reopen the courts quickly and still maintain compliance with the specified regulations. If there's anything I can do to help facilitate the changes needed to do this, I'd be eager to work with you. I think the idea of having ambassadors from neighborhoods would improve compliance with the rules. Better signage would also help. Please contact me if I could do anything to help move this process along so we can get the courts open again soon. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Young. Our next speaker is Allison Plummer. I'm writing re to request that the green spaces within the Minneapolis parks are reopened prior to any changes in the governor's <coughs> stay-at-home order. My family and I have openly supported the decisions of the state, the city, and MPRB to this point. I am also in support of closing the playgrounds, the basketball courts, and taking tennis nets down to, uh, due, to the, due to this driving many to gather in the confined spaces. With that, I think closing the green spaces within the park was a significant step too far. These green spaces and the few areas within Minneapolis that families and individuals have to, the out, have to be outside with an opportunity to appreciate nature exercise or in my family's case, give my children an opportunity to run around. We live in a city. I have two very young children, and for their mental and physical health and that of their parents, it's critical that there is somewhere for us to be uh, able to let our children run um, in a safe place. I can't let my children run down uh, a city sidewalk more than 15 yards in front of me, but I can in a park. We have always maintained social distancing within the green spaces and quite frankly have never had an issue since the stay at home order began for anyone coming anywhere near the six foot guideline. If anything, it's more like a 60 foot uh, that most people are gathering within the park. Thank you, Ms. Plummer. Our next speaker is Emily Willey. My name is Emily Willey. I'm a resident of the Lowry Hill East neighborhood, and I visit Bede Makaska and Lake of the Isles nearly every day for runs and bike rides. During this pandemic, I've seen more people of all ages enjoying the lake loops than I can ever remember before, and the numbers have only increased as the weather has grown warmer and sunnier. With school ending soon, I appreciate these numbers will only grow. I am thankful to the board for being a national leader in opening parkways to pedestrians, and as I, as I feel I can enjoy the lakes while safely distancing. It's clear that the parkways are being heavily utilized and enjoyed by thousands of folks each day, and I would urge the board to continue to lead on this issue and extend these changes at least through the end of summer. Public health is of paramount importance right now, and with cases in Minnesota rising, it should be a priority of the board to help protect residents and prevent the spread of the virus. The city's elderly, immunocompromised, and essential workers especially should be able to enjoy the outdoors without fear of contracting this devastating disease. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Willie. Our next speaker is Diane Bundley. I went to play singles in Kenwood a month ago. We had to wait a while. Finally, my friend noticed the sign on the entrance to the court. You had to get right up to, to read it, even though the words under not allowed, saying no doubles allowed, were in smaller font. The sign should have been yellow and the words no doubles allowed in the largest font possible so that it could be seen from 10 feet away. I sent email to the park and the mayor, and both were acknowledged. I said to Mayor Fry that tennis players were not the kind of folks to flout the rules, that they were just unaware due to the poorly designed signage. I also said it would cost less to change out the signs and then assess the compliance rather than to take the nets down. On Monday, April 27th, I went to Kenwood to play. Nobody was playing doubles. Several people were waiting for courts, so we decided to walk around Lake of the Isles. We were walking on the parkway and I saw the signs designated where pedestrians and bikers should be. Again, the signage could have been better designed. 
There were bikers going both directions on the parkway, and they were going too fast to read the sign. They should have been yellow signs in the parkway saying, bikers on bike path, one direction only. I don't th think people are intentionally ignoring the signs. W they, um, they didn't see them. In fact, two policemen on bicycles came toward us on the parkway. I Thank you, Ms. Bundley. Our next speaker is Jody Anderson. I have been following the news releases related to the tennis courts and their use during the pandemic. I am extremely disappointed in the knee-jerk reaction that was made to close down the courts due to a few people not practicing social distancing protocols. I have also read about the revised ruling today to allow the use of courts by appointment and supervision of park and rec employees. I am a scientist of the University of Minnesota currently researching and publishing data on COVID-19. I feel that these decisions are coming from people that have zero science background. Playing tennis can be safely done, even doubles. Have you taken a walk down to Lake Nokomis or Minnehaha Parkway lately? There are many, many people that are not from the same household walking closer than people would be playing tennis against each other. The stop lights to cross streets are just a mass of people. Why aren't those people being punished? Or have you been to Home Depot or Target? Again, people are far closer together than people would be playing tennis. Basketball, I understand. There, uh, there cannot be groups of people playing against each other. But families are just kids practicing layups. I think the solution is to use the park police to patrol around and give tickets instead of punishing everyone else. The fact that the city expects me to make an appointment to play tennis with my kids while being supervised is ridiculous. How will this work? in neighborhood courts, which are not connected to park buildings. Can we still not walk one? Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Our next speaker is David Parker. We would like to thank you for leaving East River Parkway open only to northbound traffic and West River Parkway open only to southbound traffic. Consideration should be given to closing parts of the parkway in its entirety. We have several caveats that are important for the maintenance and possible expansion of closure. One, there are areas on both East and West River Parkway that, require, that are required for access to homes. Paraphrase, paraphrasing one resident, some senior citizens and individuals with mobility impairment are dependent on deliveries of essentials and provisions of services including health care. As such, access to their homes needs to be needs to remain un, unobscured. Number two, reasonable access will be required for school campuses campuses in Beckettwood. And number three, parking areas that should remain accessible to users who have limited mobility. Please continue the closure into the foreseeable future, and we hope this stimulates consideration of limiting traffic volume and speed and eliminating the parkways as a high-speed commuter route into downtown. Commuters should use the expanded rail system, Hiawatha Corridor, and 35W. Please remember the number of COVID-related deaths is expected to double within the next several months. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Our next speaker is Michaela Livingston. As a resident of Holmes Park neighborhood, I have some concerns with your recent decision to close down tennis courts. Holmes Park and surrounding city parks offer a safe recreational activity place in our own backyard without straying too far from our homes. Being furloughed myself and my fiance, a U of M grad student, we have started playing tennis to have a daily dose of recreational activity that we have come to enjoy as it offers us physical activity that is good for both our physical and mental state as well as helps us social distancing from other park goers. Since I live across from the tennis court at Holmes Park, I have seen firsthand that this park has not broken social distancing mandates when it comes to the tennis courts as all players have been singles sets of household couples, around 95%. With the occasional family unit pair, I have seen with parents and their elementary aged children. In removing access to the tennis courts, the decision, in my opinion, has offered up alternatives and sequences and consequences that don't follow suit with keeping our community safer. 
as alternatives, we have either been forced to go out into other suburb tennis courts that are open, pushing us out of our safe, out of our stay in place community or choosing other recreational activities such as walking or running near the St. Anthony Parkway, which has more people than our local park. Working for a gym and being a group um, exercise. Thank you, Ms. Livingston. Uh, the time being 545, it is um, time for our uh, public hearing uh, regarding uh, the renaming of the Carl W. Kroning Interpretive Center to Carl W. Kroning Nature Center. And we do have a single speaker um, for uh, the public comment uh, for this public hearing. Um, and that speaker is Steve Carlson. I don't know what precipitated the desire to make a change to the center's name. If it is proposed by a member of the founder's family, Croning and or Luther, we should honor that. If the immediate community has requested the name change, then I hope these constituents are heard at your upcoming meeting. Otherwise, the name change is inappropriate for the following reasons. It is is, it is true the center provides a chance to learn more about nature, but the interpretive function and exhibits there go beyond the natural world to, world to explore human interaction with natural systems, modification of them, and our reliance on natural resources, the river. And to call it simply the nature center makes it sound like a museum of nature and not a full exploration of the nature and the humans living in, around, or sometimes against nature. For example, within nearby parklands and find the natural swimming pool, the artificial waterfall, and the trails. All of these are engineered in a way that are informed by nature. Put it another way, they are interpretations of natural systems. Interpreting such things is an important aspect of inspiring people to respect and work with nature. Number two, it was founded as an interpretive center. What diminish, what diminish, why diminish this by taking the title away? Number three, the center's history is one of joint responsibility and stewardship. There's an excellent example and lesson for an interpretive center to spread. Number four, costs. Name changes and evoke, evoke extra printing costs for new flyers, letterhead signage, the list goes on, web page content updates, directory updates. Is the little change in the name so essential to give, give it the brand you want? And lastly, maps show Carl W. Carl w. Croning Interpretive Center. Is it really essential to outmode all of the associated references for this? What is the objective? And then lastly, if you need to change the name, why not strip away the word interpretive and leave it there? People have trouble with the word anyway. You don't need to substitute it with anything else. See regarding line above. It, is that so bad? I recommend you leave the name alone. People will call the place what they want. That's OK, as long as some of the interpretive content is enjoyed or found inspirational. In conclusion, save the cost of name change and invest in the meaningful activities at the center. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Uh, Commissioner Bourne has his hand raised. Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, President Cogill. Just um, a clarification for the public record, because um, we want to make sure that we're following our naming policy here. Uh, could we just have the secretary take a roll of the commissioners present uh, in case some anybody dropped off uh, up until now? Uh, our policy says that if the at-large commissioners or district commissioner are not in attendance, that this process is void and we have to start all over. I just want to make sure we're following the process. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. I will ask uh, Secretary Ringgold to please uh, take the uh, attendance roll at this time, the time being 5.49 p.m. Commissioners, please respond when I say your name by saying here. Commissioner Bourne. Here. Commissioner Musich. 
Here. Commissioner Severson. Here. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Commissioner Hassan. Here. Commissioner Hassan. I'm here. Commissioner French. Here. Commissioner Forney. Here. Vice President Vita. Here. President Kogil. Here. Nine commissioners are present. Let it be noted to the record that nine commissioners are present during the period of the public hearing for the renaming of the Carl W. Croning Interpretive Center to Carl W. Croning Nature Center. Um, with that, seeing nobody else here to um, speak uh, on the public comment period for the renaming, I will move back into open time. We have seven uh, more uh, speakers. Our next speaker is Allison Wolf. We live in Park District 3 at 2712 West River Parkway and our driveway is connected to the parkway. We are retired and, con and expect to continue living in the beautiful parkway for many years. We write with serious concerns about the proposal to close the parkway to general traffic, allowing only residents, deliveries and the like. We support social distancing and applaud the work of the park board um, to create more space for pedestrians and bikers. We have found the restrictions to one lane on the parkway to be only a minor inconvenience. However, we cannot support the idea of closing the parkway entirely to generate to general vehicle or traffic. Among our concerns, closing the parkway to general traffic will shut vehicles into adjacent shunt vehicles into adjacent neighborhoods whose streets are not designed to handle heavy traffic, a problem made more severe during rush hour when many computer, commuters use the parkways to reach downtown Minneapolis. Closing the parkway to general traffic would create unsafe conditions, continuing the confusion amongst bikers, walkers, runners, and drivers about who is supposed to use which lane. Closing the parkway to general traffic would leave residents with limited access to our driveways. Closing the parkway to general traffic would reduce access and create confusion for deliveries, workmen, guests, and emergency vehicles. Closing parkways to general traffic would mean that citizens wishing to walk or bike. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Sophie Sue. My family lives in the Fulton neighborhood in South Minneapolis. We believe it is critical for the parkway around Lake Harriet to remain closed during June to foot traffic only. It is the only way we can walk around, lake, around, walk around the lake while maintaining social distancing. It is really lovely to be able to experience lakes, parks, and be able to walk. I fear that without these measures, we wouldn't be able to come anywhere near the lakes due to the amount of people on the paths. If the roads were open, it's one of the best moves I think the parks has done since we are a, able to safely walk and we have the health conditions that would put us in a higher risk if the roads were reopened. Thank you, Ms. Sue. Our next speaker is Chirsty Monson. The Friends of the Lock and Dam officially became the Friends of the Falls yesterday, Tuesday, May 5th, by vote of our board. The name change shifts the primary focus of our organization to the water as the primary contributor to the site's identity. We seek to transform the upper lock at St. Anthony Falls into the downtown gateway to the city's riverfront and river-connected neighborhoods with dramatically improved river access for all people. As you know, the upper lock will become the site of a visitor center consistent with the Central River Front Regional Park Master Plan. With support from the Minneapolis City Council, Meet Minneapolis, the National Park Service, and our funding partner, the Minnesota Legislative Citizens Commission on Natural Resources. Reinventing the Central River Front is a shared goal among our coalition for more than 20 years, but our intent is to do even more. 
We believe that the future of the site must be shaped together with the input and guidance from those who are here first, our Native American communities. The site requires an approach that acknowledges this historical and moral imperative. Friends of the Falls is currently in the inform and invite phase of the community engagement process that will continue over the summer, fall, and winter of 2020. We are raising awareness about engagement with organizations and communities through June and therefore will be facilitating design and programming engagement. Full information of engagement. Thank you, Munson. Our next speaker is Joseph Larson. I wrote a comment below that I, oh, I would appreciate if the superintendent or commissioners would speak to the status of the closed sections of parkways. I, I speak specifically of West River Parkway, but I know that this is a broader conversation. The current rule is for pedestrians only, but many bikers are not aware of that rule or choosing not to follow it. I know the idea of closing both sections of the parkway have been floated, as well as moving bikes to the road and pedestrians to the, both paths. The existing situation is untenable. In a time when there are many uncertainties, people are clamoring for leadership. Please do not take a hands-off approach and leave safety decisions up to trail users to navigate in the moment. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Our next speaker is Becky Alper. Over 500 Minneapolitans have signed a petition to continue and improve upon the parkway closures until there is a vaccine for COVID-19. The closures successfully address Minneapolitans' desire to walk, bike, or run outside, especially when we are sheltering in place and need to stay socially distant and healthy from COVID-19. Epidemiologists tell us the pandemic is just in the beginning stages. We believe the MPRB should, one, Minimize costs by fully closing parkways wherever possible and consider innovative procurement methods to keep this going, like having the MPRB purchase its own barricades. To re-examine the current configuration of bikers, pedestrians, cars to safely separate each as much as possible. Three, include closures in North Minneapolis so that they truly can serve all Minneapolitans. Four, extend the timeline for these closures to be measured by the ongoing need for social distancing, not just short-term order not just a short-term order from the governor. Thank you for your bold leadership and out-of-box thinking during this global pandemic. Your swift actions have both saved lives and served the MPRB's mission well. Thank you, Ms. Alper. Our next speaker is Joshua Hudek. Dear MPRB commissioners and Superintendent Bangora, pools, beaches, and water parks are closed. Basketball courts and playgrounds are closed. Skate parks, athletic fields, and recreation centers are closed, all for good reason. But the Sierra Club implores you to keep one critical community many open for people and not cars, the parkways. We applaud you for Minneapolis leading the nation the moment, second, at the moment second only to Oakland in closed streets to vehicles during the COVID-19 pandemic. The need for outdoor exercise and respite in a safe, socially distanced manner is greater than ever and not going away anytime soon. The over 8,000 active Minneapolis members and supporters of the Sierra Club North Star chapter encourage you to, one, extend parkway closures to vehicles to at least Labor Day or until there is no more public health need for social distancing, to open more parkways and vehicle lanes with existing within existing closed parkways to walking, biking, and rolling. We understand there is significant expense involved in these decisions, but as mentioned, nearly all outdoor and indoor MPRB amenities are closed. We encourage the Park Board to consider investing in MUTCD barriers and then rent them to outside groups for future post-pandemic events. Another cost-saving measure we suggest is to reduce the need of traffic cones and channelized delineators by Thank you, Mr. Hudek. Our final speaker uh, is Christy Poppenfuss. I'm a veteran public school teacher and school social worker. Our city's children and families, young and old, need places to safely go and walk and bike outside during this pandemic. Local parks and local streets are not enough, especially when nearly all with all amenities being closed. 
I urge you to put Minneapolis families first and extend parkway closures to at least the end of the summer. Expand closures to several, to expand closures to serve all city residents in both North and South Minneapolis and three, fully close every park possible. This should save money on traffic cones needed for partial closures, i.e. West River Parkway. Thank you, Ms. Poppenfuss. Uh, that concludes our open time. There are no other speakers present. So we will move on with our agenda. Um, we have two discussion items this evening. Uh, the first being the 20-year neighborhood park plan or MPP 20 annual report presentation. And I will turn it over to uh, Director Wiseman to uh, kick us off on that discussion item. Good evening, President Kogel and commissioners. This is our third annual report of our 20-year neighborhood park plan. The report is available online at www.minneapolisparks.org backslash MPP20. I have not um, provided the commissioners with printed annual reports. If you would like a hard copy printed report, if you could email me and I would be glad uh, to make sure one is um, sent to you. So our NPP 20 annual report is structured with information uh, around the NPP 20 ordinances, planning and implementation, as well as a report out on operations, maintenance and repairs, rehabilitation and capital investment. The 20 year neighborhood park plan was established by concurrent ordinances with the city council back in 2016. We also passed criteria based systems for capital and rehabilitation neighborhood park project scheduling ordinances. The ordinances establishes the allocation of the funding. It is data driven, criteria based for funding and prioritizing capital investment. It addresses racial and economic equity, community characteristics, park characteristics. We are honoring the capital improvement program that was established and in place prior to the start of NPP 20. So between 2017 and 20, 2021, there are projects that have been honored and then there's other projects that have received um, expanded um, investment due to the NPP 20 dollars. Rehabilitation projects have been identified and prioritizing, prioritized using equity criteria and other factors. And maintenance has been improved throughout the park system. According to the ordinance, we are providing this annual report to provide key financial data. And we are reporting this 2019 report covers 2018 through 2020. We also need to provide impacts to overall operating costs. MPP 20 expects to improve efficiency and costs by increasing maintenance and repair, we will be able to maximize the service life of park assets over time, reduce the backlog for repairs and rehabilitation projects. A reduced backlog results in larger number of park assets that are consistently available to the public. And we will also experience some savings as a result from investments in energy efficient materials. For the NPP 20 maintenance, this was funded through a property tax levy, which began in 2018 or 2017 and has been incrementally increased uh, based on the property tax levy increases per year. In 2018 and 2019, the amounts were respectfully 
were 3.1 and 3.3 respect, um, respectively. Those amounts were fully expended in those years. In 2020, the amount is 3.5 million. That re was a 5.8% increase from 2019. And it is projected that we will utilize uh, the whole allocation in 2020, even with uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. For maintenance, service levels are uh, being improved due to this increased funding. We have established the practices of improving, analyzing the current procedures, evalu evaluating and developing a work plan, training staff and implementing the program changes, evaluating the outcomes and fully initiating new procedures. The next chart show the improvements that have been made in the service air, um, service levels. And I know that this, this is a little bit hard to see on the screen, but in areas like turf mowing and gardens and planted area maintenance, we have um, been able to meet the target service levels for those areas. And then in some areas, we are continuing to progress and improve on those service levels. Then we get into our capital improvement program. The capital improvement and program includes 2.5 million that predated NPP 20. That was the historical amount that we received um, in bonds for our capital and rehabilitation programs. MPP 20 provided an additional $8 million for a total of 10.5 million. There will be adjustments made to this amount every five years. Those negotiations will happen this year for the coming up five years. Our capital improvement program is adopted through our annual budget. It's a six year CIP program. You'll see the chart to the right uh, shows the $10.5 million between 2019 and 2024. The green represents the rehabilitation program, and the red is the capital improvement program. And over time, the rehabilitation amounts will decrease, allowing more money for uh, capital investment. I'm now going to turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Michael Schroeder, who will walk you through the MPP 20 Rehabilitation Program and Capital Improvement Program. Thanks, Julie. Uh, President Kogel and Commissioners, I'll just walk through these uh, several slides quickly. There's a lot of numbers on them, and I'll try and highlight some of the um, things that might seem to be um, the kind of aberrations as we move through. Um, so first of all, starting with the rehabilitation program, it's, it's really oriented around park safety and some of the things that have been uh, considered deferred maintenance over a number of years. We have a significant uh, amount of work to do in catching up with ADA guidelines. Um, and there's a lot of things that are in parks that, are, that, that we're focusing on that are just in need of repair or replacement. And the rehabilitation uh, program is intended to not completely replace those facilities, but help us get to the point where we can make a capital, uh, the needed capital investments. When we go through the process, we have been um, reviewing um, the inventory of all of these park assets and, and assessing their conditions. We did a significant amount of assessment in the first year of the program. And um, in that we, um, we bring in engineers for roof inspections, um, we've had some some other kinds of assessments that have had been done through the system, and we continue to move through that. We have one large area of assessments remaining, and that's relative to park lighting. Um, we rank these assets um, based on their their needs or their condition for rehabilitation, um, and then we prioritize them, um, considering a number of factors, um, including uh, the, the the time when a capital program might happen and the amount of uh, time that might we might have um, 
to to actually do a capital in, or a rehabilitation project um, for that for that particular asset. Um, I'm I'm not actually sure who's con oh there was someone else who's controlling the, the slide so I'm gonna I'll, I'll pause slightly as we're ready for the next slide. So this is since our report covers 2018, 19, and 20, we'll review. Uh, the rehabilitation categories, and you can see that when we reach back to 2018, um, we have um, wholly expended the nearly $4 million budget mm -hmm. across the um, seven uh, uh, rehabilitation categories. And in the column on the right, you can, from the far right of the slide, you can see the number of projects that have been taken care of. So accessibility improvements, those are the ones we're doing under the ADA. Um, and that is, there was a, a significant number of projects and we've been moving through some of like the restroom improvements, which are considerably expensive. Um, and uh, we, we continue to move through other projects. Um, and, and in 2018, we have, as of now, we've completed all of the projects um, from the 2018 rehabilitation list. Um, 2019, um, we have, uh, it, it's a similar story. There's a few areas um, where we have not used, utilized all the dollars allocated. If you look at roofs where we're at 75% allocation, it's simply because we didn't have enough dollars available to start the next roofing project. Um, some of the roofing projects like the one we're doing at Luxton Park at that building are considerably expensive when we didn't have enough money in one year. So we're using dollars in two years. Um, and if we look at park lighting, I've mentioned already um, that we have, we have used some of those funds as we move through and tie rehabilitation projects in with capital projects, but we haven't done the full park lighting assessment yet. When we look at 2020, we're just getting started on these projects. Um, and so using these dollars, we don't have uh, any completed, but at the pace that we're on um, with the rehabilitation projects, you will be seeing next year uh, completion rates that are similar to what we were seeing in 2019. Um, we've been able to take advantage of the um, target market program for a lot of these projects. And um, the, some of the issues we've had with um, uh, bidding projects through the city, we have become, we, we've kind of found ways to keep things moving. Um, the, one of the big things is we just know the staff there better and they understand our processes better. So when we get to, to this review a year from now, um, I would imagine that uh, the, the columns under percent allocated and number of projects completed will be substantially similar to what you were seeing in, for 2019. Um, for capital investments, Julie mentioned that we have a system for ranking improvements based on uh, the, the equity ordinance. Um, and we allocate those funds to parks based on the rankings on a rolling uh, basis. Um, when we've looked at where we will end up through the end of this program, um, or through, when we get through every single park, we'll be at about um, probably 15 or 16. So as we imagine uh, the NPP 20 program over, the, over its entire life uh, cycle, we will actually be getting to some parks a second time as we move through this. So this is a list of projects that we have um, from the 2018 capital program. Um, and you can see that many projects are completed. There are a few that are not. And some of those projects we were simply waiting on until we had the um, service area master plans completed. So if we look at like Jordan Park, a level square, um, Perkins Hill, um, those were projects where we wanted to wait for the master plan to be completed. And even Perkins Hill, uh, at the next board meeting, you'll be, uh, there will be a public hearing uh, for the first phase of improvements to that project. Um, so, so when we look at 2018, um, largely projects are complete. There's a, an aberration at Stewart uh, Field. Um, we, we are behind, but we are working on that now and moving through the community engagement uh, process. 2019. Um, these are projects that we will have, we would have started the uh, engagement during 2019 and, and the design, so we're not nearly as far in most of these projects. Um, but as we move through um, this year and next year, 
you will see completion rates that um, largely again reflect what we found in 2018. And here we are in 2020. These are the, the dollars that were just invested this year. And um, with this, you'll see that we have we really haven't started on, on those projects in terms of uh, consuming the dollars that have been allocated. And we basically have a two or three year cycle for completion of capital projects. So these projects will be finished at the end of 2021. Some may actually lag into 2022. Um, one thing I'll note on here, the, the Phillips Aquatic Center, um, it, is, it, it was complete, but we used an allocation of part of uh, the capital project contingency when that project was completed because there was a shortfall, uh, a significant shortfall that required us to de dedicate um, $260,000 for several years of the um, NPV 20 program. And I would turn it back to Julie to put a question. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wiseman and Assistant Superintendent Schroeder. Uh, Commissioner Vita uh, has her hand raised. I think, thank you, President Cogill. I think Director Wiseman um, answered my question. My question was around um, if she was planning to ask for more money um, because the ordinance says that for money for 2022 to 2026, we need to get it. Now we need to ask for it this year. So I, um, I think she answered my question, but I also want to just say like, it's very important for us to ask for more money this year in these times. Thank you, Vice President Vita um, agreed. Uh, I think that we have uh, Commissioner Musich next. Thank you very much, President Kogel. Um, I don't know if Julie wanted to respond to Commissioner Vita before I asked my question, or if you don't feel like something is necessary to respond to in her inquiry. President Kogel and Commissioner, or Vice President Vita and Commissioner Musich, we, um, I did answer that. We will be working with the city in uh, 2020 to establish the rate or the increase for the next five years. Okay, excellent. I thought that's what you said, but I just want to verify. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate this update. Um, I will need to read the full report, I guess, to see if I have any additional questions. But I most frequently get questions from the public about how they can figure out when the falling apart uh, amenities in their neighborhood park are going to be either replaced through the CIP or when maintenance will be done to hold them together if they've found the CIP and realize that their park is really far down the list. So um, I still don't quite understand how that works. Uh, is there a place where commissioners and residents can find a list of identified maintenance projects and a ranking of those projects to determine when approximately they might be seeing something that's falling apart repaired. Uh, does, does that exist somewhere? If not, is, is it something we potentially could put together and make available to the public like we do with our capital improvement project list? President Cogill, Commissioner Musich, I will defer that question to Assistant Superintendent Schroeder. Commissioner Musich, um, we have the list, and um, particular to the rehabilitation projects, we have those lists and we use them. Um, as, as we move through, they're not as specific in terms of um, defining by year because we have the highest priority and we're simply working from the top to the bottom. So they would be able to see in those lists how close the, their, their project is. It's like putting your name in, in a line for a restaurant. You don't know exactly when you're going to get seated, but you know you're behind another party. So someone would be able to tell about when their project is coming up, but they wouldn't be able to tell specifically uh, when, uh, like uh, on, a, on a season or a month or a quarter, exactly when it would be coming up. The other thing that happens is oftentimes with rehab projects, um, we move through them and we find that the costs increase during the, their, during the period of the project. It's the nature of the rehabilitation. We're, we're taking on things that are significantly deferred 
and we're finding things as we move through them that also need to be repaired. And as long as we're in there doing those, those projects, we take on the additional work. So uh, the projects might actually grow during time, times, which means that there might be less money during a particular year to take on the next project. But we do have those lists and we could uh, provide them to you. I don't know the, 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 the link that we could do, but we'll find a way to get rehabilitation projects identified similar to the way that we do capital projects. That would be excellent. Um, fortunately, right now, I just feel like when people ask me that question, I'm going to tell them I'm going to get back to them, and I'm going to get back to them with an answer that's not satisfactory. <laughs> so I don't have a place to point them. Um, that's, a, that's a resource that's publicly available. So if we could do that, that would be excellent. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Um, I totally appreciate that it's a little bit crazy to do rehab work. It's like anyone who's ever done a remodeling project is well aware the minute you open a wall, things could become much bigger of an issue for you than you thought they were. So uh, thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. That's all I got. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Our next speaker is Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Colgill. Uh, thank you, Director Wiseman and the Su Assistant Superintendent Schroeder for the report. Um, as we're going into our first um, benchmark conversation for future funding in the agreement, uh, there, there have been, I, I just want to remind folks that when uh, the city and the park board and the board of estimate and taxation put together NPP 20, there, there was a community promise that we would be fixing broken things um, and um, and rehabilitating rehabilitating parks that have suffered from years and years of deferred maintenance. And I also just want to remind folks that this still did not close the gap on our deferred maintenance schedule. So we are still falling behind. Uh, but there are also some commissioners on this board that have rightly advocated for funding for undeveloped parks. Um, I, I disagreed at, at the times where uh, some commissioners have advocated for breaking the community's trust and um, effectively stealing these rehabil rehabilitation funds for um, for new projects in undeveloped parks, but as we are in a benchmark conversation with the city, I, I would be very open to having that conversation with the city now and creating a special undeveloped parks fund within um, with uh, within NPP 20. Uh, but I certainly would not be interested in in betraying the community's trust and taking the the base level funding for NPP 20 and using that on on newer projects that would only that would only widen our maintenance gap over time. So if President Cogill, Director Wiseman, Superintendent Bangora, when you're moving into those conversations, we do need a set we do need a stream of funding for undeveloped parks. And it does make sense that that could be a sub fund of new funding for NPP twenty. So I, I would just encourage folks to um, keep that in mind when, when we're having the conversations with the city moving forward the next phase of NPP 20. Thank you uh, very much, Superintendent, or uh, Commissioner Bourne. Appreciate it. Um, do we have any other comments from any commissioners? Seeing none, I'll just say thank you, uh, Director Wiseman, for the report. Um, certainly some um, decisions to be uh, looked at here uh, as we move forward. Um, and I um, appreciate all the work that's being done to do, especially the rehabilitation work as we move forward. Um, I, I maybe had one question. Uh, I think this might be for this for uh, Superintendent Barrick, and I, I may have asked it in the past also. Our mowing schedule has has increased, and that is is that is it correct to say that that's across the board everywhere in the system? President Kogel, uh, yes, that yes, we with the centralization of mowing, um, we do a, a daily average, and I believe we're at ten days um, average. Um, but that again is an average where there are some athletic fields and such where we're mowing weekly. Sometimes 
certain areas have to be mowed twice a week. And then there's other areas where, you know, it's a slower growing grass, less use, we can stretch out how much longer we can go before mowing. But as a whole, we have reduced the number of days on average in our mowing rotation. Got it. Okay. So it, it, it has to be an average and that's the, is that the stipulation in MPP 20 that it has to be the, the average um, time period? Um, Sorry, sorry, President Kogel. Um, that, that was the measure and the metrics that um, was in place when I got here um, got was that daily average. We've talked about the potential of refining it because we were able to hit, hit the target so early. We have talked about refining the mowing target to maybe breaking it out by mowing rotation specific to athletic fields, natural areas general lawn areas we have talked right. about that okay yeah i would encourage i'm glad to hear that that has been a discussion point it seems to me that there are some areas that maybe don't need a 10-day uh, rotation schedule um, and especially as we're looking at various ways to reduce carbon emissions etc mm -hmm. in our system it may be somewhat small but um, uh, just a general ongoing concern that i have with with that across the system um, Sure. President Colgale? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. This, I just wanted to add that uh, when we established these service levels, it was prior to us having view works as well. Got it. So I have Got been it. working with asset management and staff on potentially developing um, different service level measurements that would be uh, that we have access now to that mm. would be more beneficial and useful to this conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, um, Director Wiseman. All right. Seeing no other hands raised or questions from any commissioners. Seeing none. Uh, uh, thank you again for the report. Uh, we will uh, move on here to uh, Superintendent Bangora's uh, presentation on our COVID-19 response update, um, and I know the superintendent uh, has many, uh, many items to cover here, and uh, we do have a guest from the city. Uh, welcome, uh, Heidi Ritchie. Um, thank you for being here this evening, um, and I will uh, turn it over to the superintendent, um, and I, th I think I'll ask, um, you know, if, if possible that we hold our, our questions to the end. I'm sure there'll be a variety of questions, um, but hopefully uh, the superintendent's presentation can provide uh, uh, ample context um, ahead of the discussion. Thanks. Uh, thank you, President Colgill, and thank you, commissioners. Um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge not only um, Heidi Ritchie, the uh, policy director for Mayor Fry but also we have Noya Woodridge. Um, I believe she's on the Deputy, um, the Deputy Commissioner for the Health Department. Uh, Susan Young with the Health Department. I apologize, I don't have your exact title. Um, Kenya, um, uh, boy, this is going to be sorry, Irina Murrow, uh, Health Inspector, and also um, Margaret Schuster, Senior Public Health Specialist. I hope I got those right. And forgive me, Susan, for not having your exact title, so I apologize. But they are, um, they are with us today, and they can give um, context and information um, along with what we are presenting. And so I am grateful that they're here and thank you for being here. Um, so to begin with, um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for this opportunity to provide uh, a COVID-19 update. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just say next slide if that works out okay. Uh, I think Jennifer, you're steering. So if we go to the next slide, um, so since my last update on April 22nd um, board meeting, uh, there are several COVID-19 milestones that I'm going to report on tonight and, and um, in the order that they occurred. So on April 23rd, we received a recommendation from the Minneapolis Health Department for closing several park amenities. On April 24th, we announced park amenity modifications and closures. On April 28th, we distributed the FAQ on the closures and modifications. On April 29th, hygiene stations were ordered for PV and Logan Parks, and recently a hygiene station has been ordered for the mall. 30th, 
Governor extended the stay at home order until 11.59 p.m. Sunday, May 17th. And on May 1st, we extended parkway closures to today, uh, May 6th, to commissioners could consider the resolution before them tonight. So I'm also very pleased to provide an update tonight on the important work that's underway for recreation programming and Teen Teen Works. Next slide, please. So the Minneapolis Health Department recommendations to NPRB, and I'll try to put this into a little bit of context. On April 23rd, the day after our board meeting, the Minneapolis Health Department recommended that we make unavailable amenities which intrinsically make it difficult for people to physically distance, such as basketball, soccer, use of playground equipment, trails, and tennis courts. Recommendations included taking down basketball hoops, soccer nets, and tennis nets. This recommendation followed several weeks of extensive effort to encourage park users to protect themselves, protect others, and practice social distancing. I want to remind everyone that on April 3rd, the Minneapolis Health Department provided clear guidelines to us for what is allowed and not allowed for a variety of park activities to ensure social distancing. In response to those guidelines, we launched our Do Your Part campaign on April 9th to encourage better compliance with social distancing to avoid closing playgrounds, removing tennis courts, and removing basketball rims. These guidelines, park signage and details on the Do Your Part campaign were shared with commissioners, staff, and the public on April 9th, as well as during the April 22nd board meeting and my April 23rd daily email to staff and commissioners. On April 10th, the Minneapolis Health Department recommended removal of basketball hoops due to concerns about lack of social distancing on basketball courts. We shared them with, uh, we shared them that our Do Your Part campaign had just launched and that our Park Ambassadors programs was being launched the next day on April 11th. At that time, we were hopeful that we could avoid closing or modifying park amenities as we already um, was already happening locally and across the country in other park systems. Uh, next slide, please. I want to stress the Minneapolis Health Department's recommendations are in alignment with the Minnesota Department of Health and most importantly, Governor Waltz's executive order related to outdoor recreation. On April 18th, on April 18th Governor Waltz issued the Executive Order 2028-2038, sorry, which contained new language for allowing for safe outdoor recreation. To provide additional clarity, the Minnesota DNR and the Minnesota Department of Health developed new outdoor recreation and COVID-19 guidelines that included making six feet of separation between participants from different households. Section of our outdoor recreation activity specifically states Individuals must not engage in outdoor recreation activities in close proximity to others from different households, and that groups within a single household may engage in outdoor activities or sports that do not allow social distancing. Example would be, of course, soccer and basketball, but should not engage in such activities with members of other households. On April 30th, Governor Waltz issued Executive Order 2048, which in addition to extending a stay at home order, added language to the outdoor recreation section and also added language to the displacement section. The section of on outdoor recreation activities was updated to state activities must be undertaken in accordance with the Minnesota law and park rules. The section of displacement was updated to state and local government entities and providing sufficient alternative, alternate housing, shelter, or encampment space that complies with the Minnesota Department's Health and CDC guidelines, or if an encampment has reached a size or status such that it is documented threat to the health, safety, or security of residents, state or local governments may restrict, limit, or close encampment spaces. Next slide, please. Park modifications and closures announced. 
Despite our effort to outreach and education, Minneapolis Park visitors continued to congregate and not practice safe social distancing. So on Friday, April 24th, we announced we are modifying or closing some park amenities for the health and safety of park visitors and the community. Modifications and closures were complete on week, a week later on May 1st. Our messaging stressed that parks remain open, however, based on public health recommendations, the following amenities would, uh, would be modified or closed. On May 1st, playgrounds, skate parks, and athletic fields were closed. Um, tennis, uh, tennis court nets removed, basketball court rims blocked or removed. Already in place at that time, volleyball nets would remain down and trail users would need to remain six feet apart, which is why parkways have been closed to create social distancing. As weather continues to warm, we are adding signage at picnic areas to limit gatherings to 10 people or less and adding signage to disc golf areas with social distancing guidelines, similar to the new guidelines at the MPRB golf courses. To alert the public these modifications and closures, we used a variety of methods. An email announcement was sent out to 44,000 subscribers Post on social media registered 45,000 impressions, and a news release was sent out to 50 local and multicultural media. 2,000 laminated closed English and multi-language signs were placed on amenities throughout the park system, and the park ambassador continued to share information while in the parks daily. And again, we have over 150 staff in our parks and regional areas. Uh, next slide, please. FAQs developed for closures. In response to com commonly asked questions, we developed and shared a frequently asked question sheet and shared the information with commissioners, staff, and the public. The biggest question by far was, how did the MPRB decide to close and modify park amenities? Our decisions were based on the Minnesota Executive Order, which is the governor's order, public health guidelines or guidance, complaints and observations, and local and national trends for park closures. We explained how the public had been informed about the Minneapolis Health Department's recommendations and the MPRB's actions to close, modify amenities through park signs, park ambassadors, gov delivery, media coverage, gov D announcements, and social media. When asked if there was scientific evidence if there was showing the virus can spread in outdoor environments, we explained that this national pandemic is unprecedented and fluid and that we have responded as data has changed. But one thing that did not change and does not change, which is the local and national focus on social distancing, both indoors and outdoors. And the governor has said it very well, the only cure, the only vaccine is social distancing. We received a lot of questions from the tennis community based on why tennis nets were being removed in addition, uh, to health uh, in addition to health, public health guidelines, we took into consideration the USTA recommendations. When we asked why golf courses and trails are remaining open while other amenities are closing, we explained that golf, close proximity is not part of the game. Modifications to golf courses and parkways for safety and social distancing have been made and have or has been made. We recognize the difficulty of these closures, but the decision was made for the health and safety of the community to slow the spread of COVID-19. In a bit, I'm going to provide an update for the outdoor and virtual programming that is being rolled out soon. Next slide, please. On April 22nd, I shared how we're working with city leaders and experts who are leading the ongoing Unify local response to serving people experiencing homelessness. In addition to the four restrooms um, buildings we opened on April at Bryn Mawr, uh, Bryn Mawr Meadows, Mueller Park, Marshall Terrace, and Willard Park, the city, the city of Minneapolis Public Health Department is funding three new hygiene stations in our parks. Hygiene stations were added to PV Park and Logan Park on the last week, and a new station will be added by the end of the week at the mall. 
Next slide, please. On April 30th, Governor Walz extended the stay-at-home order until 11.59 p.m. Sunday, May 17th. As a result, the closures of NPR parkways and roads were extended through May 6th for board to consider a resolution granting spending authority to, my, to the superintendent myself to keep parkways closed to motor vehicles through Sunday, June 7th. Next slide, please. Programming update courts, fields, and virtual options, which I mentioned earlier to give you some context. I'm really proud of the work being done by the cost department COVID-19 program team. They have been working hard to assess all summer programs to determine what can be modified for social distancing or done virtually and what needs to be canceled. With the closures of our courts and fields, there has also been looking, there, we've also been looking for safe, creative ways to provide programming in these spaces. Once the stay at, uh, stay at home order lifts, they will launch phase one programming that would include eight courts, four basketball and four tennis. Park sites will be selected based on equity toolkit, racial equity rec center funding, and the equity matrix and distribution across the city. There will be daily scheduled times to walk up play for individuals and members of the same household for 30 minute intervals. They are looking for the potential of community partnerships and volunteers. And I'm working diligently right now um, with several partners we can talk about later that we're hoping can start to work with us and uh, be partners and volunteers in the work so we can start expanding that throughout the city. They are looking at the potential for community partners and volunteers. Sorry, I just said that. Park ambassadors will also be on site to deliver structured programs and safe access to those amenities. The program team is working on details, uh, which will be announced before the stay at home order ends. So of course the stay at home order ends on the, 8th, uh, on the 17th. So we will have more information coming soon on, um, on the work that we're gonna be providing. Um, so we're also looking towards phase two, which will include expanded locations. In addition to the basketball and tennis programming, there is much more outdoor and virtual programming planning underway. The COVID program team is developing options for modified <clears throat> social distance program and clinics at select athletic fields. Virtual program offerings rolling out this week with a new EW webpage hosting a quick link to download and virtual options. We just launched uh, www.minneapolisparks.org backslash virtual uh, programs uh, late uh, this afternoon, and there are currently 10 spring programs featured, and there will soon be many more summer virtual programs listed. And again, we're still in the shelter in phase, and so the social distancing program again will begin after the 18th. Right now, with the governor's executive order to shelter, shelter in, we are working diligently on the virtual programs, which will also continue. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Team Teamworks update. As many of you know, uh, we received significant funding uh, for our Team Teamworks programs. Um, the state deed funding uh, must be used or it's lost. So I'm very pleased to share that we'll be hiring teams this summer using the $200,000 in deed funding and $100,000 in funding we received from the Independent School District uh, 916. Uh, there are three areas that we'll be hiring the teams. For our Summer Rec Plus program, we'll be hiring approximately 35 youth to assist full-time certified staff. Uh, with youth programming and social distancing requirements. Um, as part of the Park Ambassador Program, we'll be hiring approximately 43 youth and park ambassadors to assist certified staff at assigned parks and providing information and encouragement on social distancing practices in neighborhood and regional parks. At the J.D. Rivers Garden, we will hire six youth to assist certified staff in planting, maintaining and harvesting vegetables at the garden. And also like to just state that many factors were considered when we were developing this plan, including transportation needs and placing youth within their neighborhoods. Um, we, we looked at group size to ensure social distancing, um, funding requirements uh, for income, age and risk factor guidelines to meet uh, the D guidelines. So with that, that was my um, overview that I wanted to share uh, with the board and with the public. Um, I will say that these decisions had been very difficult and I know there's been a lot of feedback on it. 
but I'm hoping that the information that I've been sharing, sharing with commissioners, with you commissioners, and with staff, with staff externally, that a lot of this information is not new, that you have seen this in my regular uh, weekly updates around this pandemic. This is unprecedented, and this is, uh, I want you to know that I, I every day think about the public health of the people we serve, and my priority is to the health and safety of our public, number one. And I follow those guidelines by the executive order, by the public health department, by our Minneapolis health department, and by our partners who guide us every day in the decisions that we make around our park system to keep our public safe. So with that, I will uh, take questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you uh, very much, uh, S Superintendent Bangora. Um, that's very helpful. Um, uh, uh, we have, I'm sure, many um, comments and questions. I will uh, uh, want to remind commissioners to be succinct um, uh, and we'll be uh, timing uh, our uh, responses, three minutes, and then a one-minute response. Um, that will be greatly appreciated, and I will be letting folks know when their three minutes are up. Uh, our first speaker, uh, we have uh, I think Commissioner Severson is first. Commissioner Severson. Yeah, thank you, President Calgill. Um, so I sent you a few pictures, both President Calgill and um, Superintendent Bangora, uh, a picture from the Star Tribune that many of you probably have uh, seen uh, when you read the story. So would you say that um, the uh, folks are um, social distancing around our lakes and falls right now? Commissioner Stevenson, is that question for me? Yes. Oh, sorry. I apologize. I thought I said President uh, Cogill. Um, you know, we, we have, um, I'm sorry, President Cogill, Commissioner Stevenson. Um, there are people that are in large numbers that are at all of our uh, regional parks in our system. So um, there are people that are close by each other. Um, one of the reasons why we did the uh, park closures, the 25, 21 miles of closures, was because we know that our regional systems and our parks are the most heavily visited spaces, um, only a second, of course, behind the Mall of America regionally. We have 26 million visitors that come to our park system, 26 million. So yes, the, there are people that are out in numbers. They are visiting our locations. The best that we are doing at this point is that we are offering and, uh, and opening our streets and uh, to pedestrian and cyclists and people walking and rolling around our system. That's been the effort and we're incredibly proud of that. But I do understand your question and I know that uh, there are a lot of people uh, at our regional systems and visiting our regional system. Uh, Superintendent, because my time is short, my, my question was, would you say that the people around the lakes and our falls in our regional facilities, would you say they are social distancing according to what I'm seeing in the multiple pictures that are being sent to me? Commissioner Severson, I've seen social distancing with all the people around our park systems and in our regional parks. Um, they are moving um, at times if they're stopping, but they are moving. So I have witnessed social distancing for a majority of the people around our lakes and around our regional systems, yes. So that picture I sent you, that was social distancing. Again, if people are congregating, I'm sorry, Commissioner Severson, if people are in a space and they're standing in a particular place for a period of time, that's a different question if people are actually moving and walking or exercising. Uh, so if the question is that are people at times standing at stoplights or that they're on trails and they're stopping and they're talking, I'm sure that's happened, yes. If you're now, asking people, you? I'm sorry, go ahead, Commissioner Severson. Because my time is short. Yes. Can you share the picture that I sent you? I just tried sharing it on here. Uh, I hit the share button, but it won't allow me to um, share it because it says uh, another participant yeah. is sharing it. Um, sure. Can I ask the uh, uh, the Department of Health uh, the same question? Would you say that um, the people around our regional lakes and, and parks, would you say that people are responsibly socially distancing? Is there anyone there from the Department of Health? Hi, this is Margaret from the Minneapolis Health Department. And yes. I you. I would not be able to, I'm, I, I'm not sufficiently able to answer your question as I don't live in Minneapolis. I work in Minneapolis 
and I am um, physically distancing myself from going to the lakes, um, even in the city where I live, because of the crowds of people that I've seen there. So I've been there once in the past month and felt sufficiently um, unable to um, socially distance that I have chosen to go elsewhere. So I try to, uh, can you guys see the photo that I just posted? Yes, yes, it's up Commissioner Severson. Okay, that is a screenshot of the Star Tribune's the picture. I, I see plenty of people sitting down. I'm gonna make an assumption that all these people are not related or live under the same household. So the reason I ask this question is my biggest concern is I, I think that we are making some tough to, uh, choices and decisions uh, that are very appropriate. But my concern is we are micromanaging one set of people uh, and people that I feel like I heavily represent in my district, although we're not going to micromanage uh, the people in the picture that I'm uh, showing you guys here in this meeting now. Uh, it's very concerning to me and, and it's very frustrating because I know uh, that you would have a million people uh, come in to comment about this, but I hope other commissioners speak, speak up about this because it's very concerning. Uh, the strategy here should have been encouraging people to walk in their community and neighborhood parks and not to come out to regional parks. Uh, and it's, it's very disturbing the fact that the kids around my community don't have the opportunity to, to play horse or, or play tennis. So I, I just, I, I hope you guys get the point that I was trying to make. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Uh, our next uh, speaker with their hand raised is Vice President Vita. Vice President. Thank you, President Cogill. I don't have a question. I just had a comment. I wanted to thank the superintendent and um, his team in helping to get our young people out to work this summer. It was really important to myself and uh, Commissioner French. I can speak for it because we had extensive conversations about this. So I really appreciate the time and effort that was put into this. And I'm excited that we're going to have um, young people placed in these positions for the summer. Thanks again. That's all for me. Thank you, Vice President. Uh, our next speaker is um, Commissioner French. I had to take it off mute, my bad. Uh, I, get, I have a, a, couple, uh, a couple questions for the uh, Department of Health uh, person from the city. Uh, be before we start, before we open up our parkways to just pedestrian traffic, uh, did, did somebody come and talk to you about that first and ask for a recommendation about how that would work or how that should work? Hi, this is Margaret again from the Minneapolis Health Department, and I would not be able to answer that question because I would not have been part of the team that might have been consulted. So I can find out um, an answer to that question and get back to you. Would you, okay, so maybe I, maybe I ask a question. What's your position right now that you hold? What, what, in what capacity are you working at the City Health Department now? I work specifically on the Unsheltered Homeless Response Branch, as do Suzanne and um, Kenya, who are also on the call. Is we there any... Are there any epidemiologists from the health department that are on the call right now? There are not, I'm sorry to say. Okay, so nobody from the health department can answer questions or not. Okay. Um, I can take down your questions and take them back to our epidemiologist or... I was, I was just looking for what the epidemiologist's recommendation was for uh, in considering opening up our parkways to just pedestrian and bicycle traffic. Uh, whether there's any, I want to know if, if there is any reservations that they may have had uh, to people not being able to socially distance. My concern is we haven't had an 80 degree day yet. And the first time we have an 80 degree day, we may see thousands of people out of regional parks. And I just want to know what that would look like as far as, uh, uh, as, as far as uh, exasperating the, the spread of COVID. And, and that's, the, that's why I'm asking that question is like, it, it, I'm going to kind of uh, mirror what Commissioner Severson was saying is like, it seems like 
uh, we're sending mixed messages. Uh, one group, of, one group of folks has the ability to advocate and and then lobby for things to happen in their communities, and other groups don't. They just don't have that same access. And I really would like to to encourage other commissioners to look at it from different perspectives, and encourage them to to look at. Even though they have their own personal projects, whether it's biking or eliminating uh, car traffic, uh, we really have to take in other people's perspective. This is a political issue right here, whether you want to believe it or not. Uh, we, we can say we're just listening to what the health department wants to say. No, we, we, we have to make political decisions. That's, that's what we got elected for. And if we're being unfair, which is what I think we're doing right now, we need to address that. We need to talk about it. And we need to stop you know, relying on recommendations from people who were elected by the people by the people of Minneapolis to make these decisions, and so and, that, and I think I'm I think I'm done right now. So, thank you, uh, Commissioner French. Uh, our next speaker is Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. Uh, so, I have a handful of questions. <laughs> that I had up and I hid. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I, I've been hearing a lot from uh, residents in my district that users are not on the trail or road that's been um, designated for their use and that that's causing conflicts and um, feeling feelings that we're providing an unsafe environment for recreating, et cetera. Um, so they've suggested a couple of things that I'd like to share. Um, I don't know if they've been considered already, but I'm hopeful that there are ways that we can help reduce this issue, particularly if we pass the resolution later in the agenda to extend the uh, parkway closures. Um, so they suggested that we utilize spray chalk to do messaging, identifying where pedestrians and cyclists should be, particularly in areas where um, different trails are intersecting with our trails. Uh, for example, on 54th Street coming into Nokomis Park, the city has a trail that's designated to be used by pedestrians and cyclists that then dumps into a road closure that's only for pedestrians. So we have mixed messaging out there that's confusing for people and there needs to be a way for us to um, have very simply and large uh, messages helping people understand where they should be as they enter into the system. Um, they've also suggested, particularly um, in areas where we get congestion, like at intersections, major intersections, that we have ambassadors that help direct people to the appropriate trails and also encourage social distancing because that is where people are seeing um, people queuing up. Maybe they're great at social distancing while utilizing the trail system, but they get to an intersection and they cluster. Uh, so that's two things I wanted to share. Um, I really have to agree with my colleagues that have spoken before me that uh, we really need a citywide campaign to encourage people recreating near their homes and not trekking across the city or the state um, to recreate somewhere where they don't live. Um, I live across the street from a regional park. My street is full of cars um, of people that don't live in the neighborhood that are driving here to recreate in the park. Uh, and, and that's probably true across the city for our regional park amenities. So we really need to be discouraging that so that people that live by a regional park amenity and maybe that's the only park within walking distance of them are able to utilize that to get some outside time. Um, we also need to be stressing the message that if a park appears busy, people need to go somewhere else to recreate. They can't enter that park if it's already too busy. Uh, the Outdoor Alliance has a really great infographic about how to get outside during the pandemic. And it talks about how to respect the space and how to respect the people that are in it and how to make sure that um, you're keeping congestion in these um, really popular public spaces small. So I can share that with staff, but I really feel like we need to leverage our partners in city government uh, and county government to help get that message out and encourage people to participate in our community in a way that doesn't prevent others from doing so. Um, I, I don't know how we would shut down a regional park if people were shown to be... Commissioner um, Musich, if you could wrap up your comment. Properly. Yep. Um, so, so that I think we would really need to get active on the um, educational component of that. 
Uh, and then I was just wondering if we have somewhere the benchmarks that need to be met to reverse the actions that we've taken in response to coronavirus. Uh, the governor is talking about missiles and how we turn them and what we meet. So I'd love to see us doing something similar around park change to the way the park system works. That's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Our next uh, speaker is Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, I'll just start off by saying um, it's really easy to kind of criticize some of the executive authority that uh, the superintendent and uh, you have been given. I don't know if I would make any of the decisions differently than the, than the two of you had. I, I am a little discouraged to find out so, about some of them after they had been implemented. Um, when we talked in our last meeting about increasing that communication in, be, in between meetings. But I don't know if I would have made any different decisions. But that said, as we are talking about them, I, I think some of them are need to be revisited. And it, it's clear as day that there are more people in our regional parks not social distancing in a single day then there are people on every basketball court and every tennis court in the city and not social distancing. So, and, and we're, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to allow more people to not social distance in our regional parks. And we're shutting down some amenities that I think every other speaker has said are, are closer to home and better and better and safer for folks to recreate in. Um, and, and there's some real coded coded systemic issues around what we're closing and what we're expanding and, and I'm really alarmed by that. I'm really alarmed by that and I would really encourage us to, to revisit some of that and and really listen to some of our commissioners that have that have spoken first. But I do have a question for the health department on the uh, on the encampment issues. Uh, and and my question is so it sounds like the health department is funding the sanitation station on the mall that's scheduled to be open, is that right? This is Margaret from the Minneapolis Health Department. Yes, that is correct. We received funding from the Department of Human Services to establish eight hygiene stations around the city. And so the How mall- How is the mall chosen? Um, there, ha there has been a group of city and county employees that have been meeting for several weeks and um, as the group hears of different needs within the city to respond specifically to people that are transitory or unsheltered, um, that group considers those locations and then determines um, is that serving folks who are transitory or unsheltered? Is it also serving the general public who okay. also have limited um, access to bathrooms and hand washing stations? And the Hennepin Avenue area um, by Walker Library and the Hennepin Transit Station was one that we um, had several requests from different outreach groups as well as um, MPD as well as city and county staff. So, Ms. Schuster, are, are there plans to address and provide human dignified conditions for folks in and near the encampment on Devens Avenue? Uh, the mall is even further away than uh, Mueller is. And so it seems like we're providing resources in the opposite direction of where, where the need is. So. Is there plans to provide some human dignity for the folks at the Stevens Avenue encampment, like either on the Greenway or on the city's public right-of-way on Stevens Avenue that nobody's using right now because the road is closed? Yeah, great question, um, and thank you for asking it. At this point in time, we have two stations that are just going up in the 28th and Hiawatha encampment. And um, the I'm comment, talking about 28th and Stevens. Yep, I understood that. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to let you know that the the last two decisions that were made included the 28th and Hiawatha encampment, and um, conversations are continuing around the um, 28th and Stevens area. 
So I but don't have an answer for you. For, there's nothing planned for right now. Not right at the moment, correct. So again, for, I, I mean, the mall is further away from, I mean, who, re, who requested the mall? You said, you, was there an advocacy group that specifically requested that we put the sanitation station away from the highest need population? I'm just kind of confused about that. Commissioner Bourne, no if you could wrap up your questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, there, there was specific requests early on to do something at near that Hennepin Avenue transit station and the Walker Library because there were encampments or, or tent camping or sleeping on the ground going on in the uptown area Longer with than no on relief Avenue. to bathrooms and um, hand washing stations. So that was long before the um, 28th and Stevens um, became a larger area. So, so yes, it was it was a multi-department and cross-sectoral partner, you know, okay. um, request to do something at Hennepin Avenue. And j just to wrap up my comment, I mean, the, the 28th and Stevens location has been an encampment in one form or another for coming on the start of the 35W construction project. So coming up on almost two years now. Um, and there's a lot of people that are being treated in a very subhuman way right now. And I, I'm alarmed to hear that there's only conversations and there's no action. So um, the- Commissioner Warren, I, if you like could write, wrap up your questions, you're that. far over time. Yeah, I, just for clarification, do staff responses to our questions count towards our time? No, they do not. Okay. Well, the um, Commissioner Bourne, you can speak again for a minute time. after the next speaker. Yeah, okay. That's, Th that's thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Thank, thank you. you. Our next speaker is Commissioner Forney. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, and thank you, Superintendent um, Van Gora, for um, this um, presentation. Um, I, I agree. I am very, very um, pleased with the rollout of what you've been doing. Um, uh, I know we're going to have a discussion about the resolution, about parkways and everything, so I won't get into that. So I'll just mention that um, as far as um, team teamwork, um, I'm so excited about the fact that we're going to be moving forward with that. And I would encourage you to figure out a way I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but there has been conversation of some sort of uh, national employment funding that um, might be evolving. Who knows? But I feel if we can, you know, what should we say, position ourselves that we would be an obvious um, recipient of that and be able to tee that up um, for um, a broader um, uh, project, I think it would be something that, you know, whatever, just by our stirring may possibly, um, you know, get the state to respond to it and possibly even national, although I don't have much trust in national right now, but that's another point. Anyway, um, I want to thank you very much. Um, I have heard from a great deal of constituents about the roadways, so I do look forward to having a conversation about that. Um, I talked with um, all of the ward um, council members that are um, impacted by our road closures, and there were some very consistent uh, messaging in that, but I will bring that up again. Thank you again for all you're doing. And staff, all staff. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Our, our next speaker is Commissioner Hassan, followed by Meyer. Thank you, uh, President Kogio. Uh, my question uh, will be for uh, Superintendent Al. You say that it would be closed parks, but does that include the soccer fields? And if it does, uh, why are they still open? I mean, what is the plan for that? Yeah, uh, President Kogio, Commissioner um, Hassan, soccer fields pose a very difficult challenge because of the nature of the field itself and the size of it. Uh, it would be almost impossible to put a fence around an entire field. And we know that um, the lar largest congregation of young people or adults that play on a field could be in excess of 20, 30 people. Uh, and we know how popular our fields are, and it's the place that uh, 
people in the city and in our neighborhood to go to play. But we also know very clearly that we're in the middle of a pandemic and the virus that spreads is from contact from person to person. And it's, so it's very, it's, um, and if you look at the reports, it's happening right now in the state of Minnesota and the, uh, we're only at the very beginning of the peak of this virus. We haven't yet experienced even what this is going to be. And if you look at the number of, uh, even the number of um, data that's coming forward, number of uh, people that are um, suffering from this and, and, and uh, losing their life, it's, um, it's, it's distressing. Um, but we don't, um, it's the same thing like look at our regional park system. It's a challenge to understand how we take the volume of people that come to our lakes and are in close proximity to each other, even if they're moving. Um, but you look at soccer too, the number of kids and, and adults that come out there, we just, it, it's really challenging the number of fields we have throughout the system to put some type of a barrier, some, uh, some type to prevent it. We do know that, uh, of course, that even you can be in that, you can be asymptomatic and you can bring home something to your family. If people keep violating and not doing their part to come out there and understand how serious this is. But we're really challenged with how we block a field and how we close the field. Right now we're doing signage and right now we're doing the ambassador program. Uh, we have people at our parks who are engaging and educating and talking to our young people. And these are staff that, that work in these communities for years. People know them. They're working with their neighborhood associations, with, with residents. So we're doing everything we can from the ambassador side to address the public and to really try to say to them how serious and how dangerous and, and we want you to be safe. We want you not to get this virus. We don't want you to transmit this virus to your family. Um, and so challenge we have is the size and the space. Um, we, um, we thought of all sorts of ideas. The um, executive team and pandemic team were thinking of ways that we can uh, continue to address this. But right now, it's through messaging, it's through a social media, it's through our marketing, it's through our signage, through the hands-on people being on location and trying to prevent uh, people from using the field. It's one thing if a person, a parent comes out there and they're playing kickball with their kid or throwing a Frisbee or football or whatever with their family. That's very different than having what you call organized sports. So yeah, well, we're challenged to understand how to close it. Well, thank you, uh, Superintendent. But then also uh, the ambassadors that you mentioned earlier, uh, are they paid employees? There are full-time sort of, yes, they're, Commissioner Hassan. There are full-time certified, there are, are paid employees, correct. Okay, good. And There are full-time people like our, our rec center, our uh, center directors, our um, center supervisors, our community outreach team, um, our athletics um, our athletics team, um, our youth, adult and sports professionals and our full-time people, yes, they're all in the field. And why, uh, I haven't seen them in Elliott Park where I went a couple of times at PV Park. Kids are still, you know, playing soccer. And I think we need to do more education. And I think the picture that uh, 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 Commissioner Severson was showing us basically talks about how we lack in employees or like ambassadors being in the field. Yes. And just remind the people, I think, you know, like we can, uh, uh, we can close our eyes, you know, it's happening. People are not social distance in our parks. You know, it's obvious. I went to Peter Park. I was at the, I got an email from Powderhorn Park. Kids are still, people are still using uh, mm -hmm. the playgrounds. Uh, yes. People are not same family. And I think we need yes. to put, maybe bring back our uh, park keepers and two or three of them in each park so they can educate. And the other thing about the regional parks, maybe uh, getting rid of uh, the parkings, maybe having less parking so people know that they don't have the parking spaces. It's mm -hmm. something I think we could do. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Hassan. And uh, we're going to continue to, I mean, you know, right now, like I said, we have 150 plus staff out, but we have 6,800 acres of, uh, of land. And we've been encouraging people to use their, their local parks. We called it Stay Local. So we did put out, we're putting out, and we're going to continue that campaign for people to stay locally. Um, but uh, I hear you, and we continue to do the work that we can to try to continue to educate. And we're going to keep deploying staff out there. and and hitting these hot spots. And so thank you for talking about Elliott and PV. I appreciate that because that helps us to kind of steer staff where they need to go. So thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Colgan. Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Our next speaker is uh, Commissioner Meyer.
Thank you. I had the same question the Commission of Research had. Uh, Superintendent Bangora, can you speak to benchmarks and other criteria? Like, what are you going to use to decide for when to reopen the facilities that have been closed? Um, and I know this question has come before. I think what we're, I'm sorry, President Cogill, Commissioner uh, Meyer, uh, we are uh, following the guidance right now of the um, Minnesota Department of Health uh, through the governor's, uh, Governor Waltz's area. We're looking at um, uh, his executive orders and moving forward. Uh, we're looking at the Minneapolis Health Department. Uh, we're looking at national trends. We're looking at benchmarks across the country. We're looking at the NRPA, uh, MRPA, uh, all of our local partners through our uh, metro regional teams, uh, through you know Dakota, Carver, Bloomington, Anoka. We're talking to everybody all the time. What really guides and steers this, where all of us are coming together and talking, uh, even working with Commissioner Harrington through the um, Governor Walton's office. He's the uh, Public Safety Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Harrington went, went with him also. Uh, Three Rivers, Bull Carlson, myself. Uh, Ohado was their Chief Ohado, uh, and also, of course, Mike Hom. We're working with all agencies to determine what is the best time to start to open up and determine what is the best, um, what's going to be the safest and most um, careful way that we start to kind of scale back into uh, what we open. Uh, right now, like I was stating in our presentation, is that we're going to be creating programs around social distancing. And we're going to be uh, doing things from a virtual and also from an active way that our staff are going to be re-engaging our youth uh, through basketball course, tennis courts, field. So we're moving back into that already. Um, opening up something broader than that, this is all dependent upon this virus and how it uh, moves through the state. Again, there's no vaccine. So opening up something fully for people to come and say, let's go play soccer, let's go play basketball again. That's not where we're at. We're, we're not even at the peak of this virus yet. So. We're working with, again, our uh, health department and, uh, and the CDC and all of our local partners. We don't know what that particular time is going to be when you say open up the parks fully again for people to um, uh, play sports again in, in numbers. Um, we're not there. And I, I feel like this is what people are really scared of is that people don't really understand what factors were used to make those decisions by whoever made them. I mean, basically what I'm hearing from your answer is, you know, listening to, to guidelines from other organizations and not that, understanding the basis. That's not what I said, uh, Commissioner Meyer. I'm sorry, that's not what I said. What I said was that my executive order comes through, um, the executive order came from, as I stated in my presentation, I've stated many times, our response to this is based on data and science and based on epidemiologists and based from the governor's office executive order to the Middle Department of Health, to our health professionals in the Minneapolis Health Department, and through the CDC. We follow that every day. So it's not just based on other agencies. We work with other agencies who are also following the same guidelines. Um, and each state has been doing different things. So there's a lot of information that exists out there, um, and people are making decisions. Our governor has made decisions. We are following the executive order, the legal executive order that I am obligated to follow based on law. And so that's what guides us. And, um, and also recommendations for a health department, which is again based on data and science of the pandemic and the virus. And so um, it's a combination of many things, but most of it, of course, is through actual guidance, through executive orders to the health department and the CDC and the Minneapolis Health Department. Okay. So what I really want to get at is like, what, what are we going to look at to figure out when we're going to open things? Like, is it going to be when testing gets to a certain level? Is it going to be when um, ICU or hospitalization rates are at a certain level? Um, I mean, it would, it would just give people some reassurance if, if they were able to tie this to something so that they're, I mean, because, you know, when you're saying that there is no vaccine, like, there's probably not going to be a vaccine for years. I mean, like, we don't want to have all our courts and playgrounds closed for that long, I hope. And so that, I'm, I'm just trying to get to something like that. Sure. Some sure. kind of criteria. Sure. President, uh, President Cogill, Commissioner uh, Meyer, yeah, thank you for the question again. And again, I think that right now, the only guidance that we have right now is social distancing, right? Right now, we know we have to be able to provide services that are around social distancing because we understand the way the virus spreads. The virus is going to be here for a while, of course, until, um, until there is a vaccine. We don't know what that's going to be. We just take each step and we just, every day, every month, we're just moving forward with what is happening across the country and what is being 
guiding our decisions through um, data and through science and through the experts around this virus. And there's many of them uh, in the state. So we take guidance in that. Um, social distancing is the only thing that we can do now to prevent the threat. We're not even at the peak of this yet, this virus. And so again, the way that it's been pushed is that it's going to be going into May, June, July, into August. Uh, they're potentially talking about a second peak that could happen because the virus is not going away. So what we need to do and what I'm guided by is my legal obligation to do what's right by the executive orders and by the health departments and by the CDC. I also have a moral obligation to make sure that our people stay safe and that we don't get, no one gets sick as much as we can prevent that um, in our parks. Um, and so a lot of work goes into that and a lot of time spent every day um, talking to the experts talking to our partners. And so I don't have a clear timeline when some, there's a trigger that just says, okay, everything's open. Because this is a pandemic and the virus is real and it's, it's a public crisis. And so I can't give you an exact day that something's gonna change, but I can tell you that we're following the data and the science that, um, that's being led by the experts. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not asking for days, I'm asking for criteria, but for in, in your Q&A um, response, you had that slide where you talked about um, outdoor transmission, but I, I didn't hear you say anything about actual data on that. I, I, is there data on outdoor transition, transition that you have used? The data that I'm President Colgill, Commissioner um, Meyer, the data that I'm looking at is specifically around the transmission of how COVID spreads. So data is still new, data is still being explored. I did say in the presentation that it, it is changing. Um, we are following and, and adapting all the time to all the different sciences and the different information that's being shared across the country about this virus. People are learning things every day about it. Sometimes we talk about six feet and they're saying now it could be more than that, right? We know that through droplets, we know that it's through talking, we know that it's in distancing, we know that if you're six feet or less, um, that's how the virus can spread through even just talking. Um, there's information on the CDC website that I can share with you, Commissioner Meyer, that really goes into depth about the science and understanding about the virus and how it spread. I have in front of me a sheet right now that kind of explains everything about the virus. Um, and so it is spread through contact, it's spread through distancing or through close proximity. Um, and that's why one of the reasons why we look at our, our soccer fields, basketball courts, if you're congregating, that's how the virus spreads. It can be inside, it could be outside. Um, as Commissioner um, Severson showed earlier around the regional park system, if people are in close proximity to themselves, even if they're walking, there's a chance that it's spreading um, from that contact. So there's different, again, I'm not the expert, but I can tell you that there's still science, they're still studying it, and it is changing all the time. Uh, so um, I don't have the exact facts. I can get you more information on that, Mr. Meyer. And if anybody from the health department wants to add to that, I'd be more than happy uh, to hear um, from our experts that are on the, uh, on the call if they want to add to um, your question. Yeah, and, and it's something that I've asked for previously and have not received any data on it. Um, does anyone from the Department of Health ha have any insight to that on like what data they're recommending for outdoor tra transmission? Hi, this is Margaret Schuster again from the Minneapolis Health Department. Um, I don't believe that anybody from the Minnesota Department of Health is on this call. They would certainly be the experts that we also would be looking toward, um, as well as colleagues at the CDC. Um, and there isn't an epidemiologist um, on the call with you today, but if uh, the questions are being gathered, um, we certainly could take this information and questions back and have someone get back to you. Okay, so, so here's, here's my thoughts on this. Um, the evidence that I've seen uh, is that indoor transmission is, is, is worse than we thought, that six feet probably isn't enough indoors, but that outdoor transmission is very low. And the, the one study from China, just one out of all the people that they studied got it from outdoors. You know, it, it's, it's very low. It is possible, uh, but um, you know, the, the other thing that's always in my mind is that we really want to be encouraging people to exercise as, as much as possible to get your vitamin D for your uh, physical and mental health and build your immunity. Like when I think about these questions, like I'm thinking, are we causing damage if we discourage people from, from going outside um, and, they, and they end up staying indoors and um, hurting their immunity? Uh, so my, like I, I want to be able to um, open up as, as many 
outdoor activities as we can safely do. Um, I would err on the side of allowing more when we don't have uh, good evidence on it. You know, we still want to prohibit gatherings, um, but uh, if other commissioners, you know, have any any motions that they that they want to make, you know, I'd be receptive uh, to some of them in Commissioner the of, Meyer. If you could wrap up, uh, sure, um, I'd, I'd be open to motions in the direction of say open like opening like courts sooner rather than later and the, the other thing I, I just want to add is that i hope that we can uh, do the same type of thing that we did for golf in regards to our programming um, for basketball and tennis like i don't see why we need to wait until uh, may 18th like I, I would hope that we would ask the governor uh, you know we have specific programming where we allocated that to people. Yes, I have no, asked I the commissioner to, to wrap up. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Um, we're now moving into a uh, second round of comments, um, starting uh, with Commissioner French for a minute. Oh, yeah, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know if this is for President Kogo or uh, Superintendent Bencora. Um, the governor's uh, suggestion or recommendation that parkways be open for more uh, uh, social distance, does that include uh, east, of the park, east of the river as well? Are there parkways that are being open east of the river? And the basketball courts that are being open in St. Paul have been open, up, I guess, since last week. And so I really, I'm really interested in the criteria that St. Paul used, if we're, if we're relying on recommendations from other uh, organizations, I really would like to know what the criteria that St. Paul used uh, for opening up their basketball courts. Uh, and maybe we could either copy that and figure out what works and what doesn't work and expedite our basketball courts being able to be utilized by, by folks. Um, President uh, Cogill, uh, Commissioner French. Um, we are doing, the, what they're doing is the same thing that we're doing. They're opening their courts based on also social distancing, and they have staff, which they also then uh, mirrored our ambassador program. So they're using the same method that we started. They then created the ambassador program, and they're opening up their um, tennis and basketball courts like we will be doing. And remember, right now we're in a shelter in. So we're in a stay in shelter and executive order until the 18th, which means that people go out, they walk, they enjoy the outdoors. No one's preventing anybody from going to a park. No one's saying you can't go to a park. Um, so they go to a park and they go for a walk and they can visit a local park, but still, it's, it's still a shelter in time. Um, oh, so I'm, 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 yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off, but we have no a very limited time. Uh, sure. I, I, I want to know why they're, 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 their courts are open right now and why we haven't figured out how to come to. And here's the thing. I don't even know. Uh, I've listened to the Chris, uh, Commissioner Meyer talk about, you know, he probably has a little bit more in-depth knowledge or study this a little bit more than I do. I, I don't think people should be gathered anywhere. That's my, but, no. but if, if they are open up in St. Paul, I'm trying to figure out what the rationale no. is. And, and, if, and if they've been open for a week or so, why, what's, what's our hold up and why are we, at, why are we expediting this? And, and, and if, if they feel like it's safe, and, 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 and if the governor feels like, you know, we should have parkways open, then East River Parkway should be open as well and, and some spots yeah. in St. Paul. So. Yeah, Commissioner, Commissioner Severson, we do. And I understand your question. I'll follow up with Mike Tom, the director um, from St. Paul Park and Recreation, on the exact reason why during the sheltering in that they're opening up their um, uh, spaces, um, tennis courts and basketball courts. I can get a specific um, answer for you on that. Um, St. Paul Park and Recreation has opened up, or the city of St. Paul has opened up uh, parkways. Um, is um, Assistant Superintendent uh, Schroeder, are you there to kind of maybe give a quick update on the um, uh, parkway openings? President Van Gorin, Commissioners, uh, I can give a highlight. Um, yeah, thank I don't you. know the specifics for St. Paul, but they did connect to the East River Parkway uh, closure, so Mississippi River Boulevard uh, provides a continuous um, uh, route and um, Minneapolis uh, and St. Paul worked together on a couple of bridge closures so that uh, folks could make a loop around the riverfront. 
I don't know the specifics of, of the length of any of those, but it's an important connection between the three agencies to make that one, uh, to make the what uh, Robin uh, Hutchison, the public works director, was calling a super loop for the Twin Cities. I, 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 I'm going to finish up, uh, uh, President Cargo, but I would just I would just encourage the decision makers at the park board, us commissioners, as well as folks at headquarters, uh, to really look at what other folks are doing, because it seems like that's what you're doing anyway, is taking recommendations from other institutions. And look at the institutions that are actually trying to expedite or trying to do more for certain groups of folks who are disproportionately being affected by this crisis. And, and that's what I'm asking. I really want us to look at who's been disproportionately affected. So I'm going to finish up. Uh, uh, President Cogler, thank you for thank allowing me to speak. Thank you, Commissioner thank French. Thank you, Commissioner French. Our uh, next speaker is Commissioner Bourne for the second time. Thank you, President Cogler. I'm going to try the best I can to advocate for some of our most vulnerable community members in the 60 seconds that I have. But um, back to Ms. Uh, Schuster from the Health Department, can, can we talk, can you give me a little bit of background on how large the population that is being served by the sanitation station at the mall is? Schuster, it seems like you're muted. Oh, maybe you're not now. There, yeah, sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, my computer decided to slow down in that moment. Um, I cannot give you that information. I could ask the people who track more of those numbers, and that's not part of my um, role within the Minneapolis Health Department. That's more a um, kind of a conversation for the city county group that meets. Uh, I know that Hennepin County tracks um, the, uh, through the point in time count and through other outreach efforts, how many people may be transitory or unsheltered in a particular location. Is there a full-fledged encampment at the mall? Again, uh, I am not aware of that, um, so I, I can't really answer that from personal experience. Um, or Is there anybody on your team that's on the call that, that can? So this is Suzanne Young. Um, uh, I'm on the Unshelter group with Margaret, and um, as she stated, our, our role is uh, the coordination um, of the of the stations, um, we haven't been um, involved in that work group. Okay, but, I, we can, but we can we can take your questions and and bring back the information. The so my my next question is. Um, are you involved with, the, is anybody on this call involved with the work, work group on Stevens Avenue? Addressing Stevens Avenue? Um, yeah, so this is Margaret again. And, um, you know, it's a cross department group that meets um, along with representatives from Hennepin County and from Street Outreach. So there are different um, meetings that occur, you know, that have a different makeup, but, but really it's that cross department, cross sector um, kind of partnership that is um, helping to make some of the decisions about, um, you know, where hygiene stations go. And that's really what our role has been is um, to help determine where those go um, along with the rest of our partners. Um, in in our, these various work groups that we're part of. So, um, if I may, President Cogill, Commissioner Bourne, this is Heidi Ritchie from the Mayor's Office. I just wanted to understand, what is is there a specific question about 20th and Stevens that I can answer? Um, there's a lot of things up in the air, especially because the property is owned by MnDOT, 
and um, it's my understanding that they are, you know, looking at some of the safety issues on the site and wanting to move ahead, but um, the paperwork that they would need to submit to the governor's office in order to work on some of those issues um, is in process, but then the actual um, mitigation efforts will take a few days to implement. Uh, thank you. So if we're specifically talking about 20th and Stevens, and I know um, we talked about that last night, Commissioner Bourne, a little bit, um, there's particular interests that you have there, and, and I understand that, and we can move forward on that, but um, I there are a lot of kind of complexities around that and different jurisdictions, and so if it's a matter of just that particular site, then we can maybe take that offline, um, but I'm not sure, I don't have any particular knowledge about the mall site either, so if there's questions about the mall site, then we can take those back and try and figure that out with um, some of the other partners that we have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ritchie. The, the overall arching concern and question is that all of the folks that inhabit, that are unfortunate enough to live in homes are also park users. So it's a larger conversation mm -hmm. about just the deployment of resources. And from what it sounds like, it's complicated, but in one of the most at need areas of the city, it doesn't sound like there's a plan. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne, for your comments. Um, our next that, that that was a that was a question. I, is there a plan, Commissioner Bourne? As I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, yes, there are discussions that I am having, as well as clearly staff have indicated they are having regarding uh, our our role in providing additional spaces for. Uh, hygiene stations adjacent to or associated with the Stevens encampments. Uh, and that is an ongoing discussion that we've had email correspondence on even just today. Um, so there isn't a plan, there's discussion. Commissioner Bourne, we're going to move on. The, we can take this question on this particular item offline. Uh, there, I think I understand the answer, thank you. Our next speaker is Commissioner Severson for the second time. Uh, thank you, President Calvio. Um, is, uh, if I could put that picture back up, I don't know who's, um, who has us on here, but is, is anyone from the health department or the mayor's office, um, would any of you agree with uh, Superintendent Bangora that social distance is actually in fact taking place in our regional parks? Is anyone comfortable stating that they believe that is, is the case? President Cogill, Commissioner Severson, this is Heidi from the, um, the mayor's office. Thank you for the question. I think what we're seeing is, you know, snapshots in time are unreliable because sometimes people are, um, they're, Oh, I'm seeing the picture right now. Yeah, sometimes people are observing social distancing and sometimes they're not. And that's why we, ha we have a role to play in all of this and that is really educating. You know, I know that we've even in the city of Minneapolis started training some of our traffic control agents who aren't, you know, um, as much in need now with uh, in decreased traffic in downtown Minneapolis. And they've been providing uh, an active presence in promoting physical distancing around some of the small parks, the school playgrounds, on the parkways. Uh, for example, from April 29th to May 5th, just yesterday, there were 11 complaints at six locations for the lack of physical distancing. Uh, one of the notes that I got was that Matthews and Stewart Park had multiple complaints during the last seven days. And we do expect to see an increase in um, in complaints and some of these issues as the weather gets warmer. I mean, we're Minnesotans. We love to get out and enjoy our yeah, lake and yeah. enjoy our parks. And so but, we just really we, have to really focus on the education around this in every single sector of, uh, of where we recreate. Well, and that's, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make here. We're gonna educate people around the falls and the lakes, but not at the basketball courts. Uh, President Cogill, would you agree well, that I, I would just interject and say that the 
what I just said was that we are traffic control agents who have been repurposed into working on kind of the physical distancing education have been to <coughs> parks and school playgrounds. So we're not, they're, they're not on the parkways. They're actually in the, the small parks and the playgrounds around the city of Minneapolis. So that's something we just started though. That's not something that we started, you know, way back when. That has been in the last, um, you know, week. So from April 29th to May 5th. So as we're just, learning about so how we can adapt to this, we are um, figuring out ways that we can be innovative and we can make sure that we're working on this collaboratively and together and, and just mo moving forward day by day. But you, you would agree that people are not social distancing all the time in our, our regional parks? Just y y yes or no, I could get I that because my time I is short. Yes, I mean, I would say, I don't know about regional parks because I don't have data to back that up, but I would say okay. anecdotally, if you look out the window, um, there are areas that people aren't social distancing. Okay, everywhere. thank you. President Calgo, you would, would you agree with Superintendent Bangor that people are in fact social distancing in our regional parks? Commissioner Severson, there are people in all of our public spaces everywhere that may or may not be social distancing, uh, and it depends okay, on the time. So just because my time is short, sorry, President Calgo. The article in the um, strip on April 28th by Miguel Ortala uh, quoted Superintendent Bangora stating that there are 125 calls of concerns about basketball and athletic fields. With that, should we encourage the public to call 911 when people are not social distancing in our regional parks? So uh, we have the data to compare to athletic spaces, so we can maybe considering closing our regional park uh, just as we have closed our basketball courts, tennis courts, and athletic fields. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Or, or Thank you for the question. Um, I would just say this: um, this is something that the board can consider right now want to bring forward any resolution at any time regarding this uh, this issue I think that is completely fine we have an item um, coming forward in a moment that is about the extension of uh, having uh, open spaces around the parkway spaces for people walking biking and rolling yes because my because my time is short president Calgo would your, you encourage your time is up call Commissioner Severson um, people social distancing in our parks, so there's data to compare. I, could you say that again? W would you, should we encourage the public to call 911 and, and when they notice people not social distancing in our regional parks, such as around our lakes in the falls? Commissioner Severson, you can encourage folks to do whatever you think is the most prudent, and we could have a discussion about the policy as needed. We can do that. At any can time, I, can I have uh, Superintendent Bangor answer that? Super, question, Commissioner Severson, your time is up. You can take that question offline. Our next speaker for the second but, time but is I, Commissioner Musich. I want it on record in the public. That it's important that data is collected not just on kids of color in our parks playing basketball and soccer, but that data is collected across the whole city. So yeah. I think it's a pretty pertinent question to get on the record. President Calgo, if I may ask you to please answer that with the Commissioner yes no, Severson, we have Commissioner Severson, no. I, I, I can tell you what what people have been advised in the city to do to report. Uh, no, no, uh, um, uh, it's uh, they're supposed to be calling I'm, I'm 311. Point of order, to... President Cogill. <clears throat> this is a specific question. At okay, the, so uh, the point uh, of order uh, trumps everything else happening. So point of order, President Cogill. President Cogill. Cogill. Yes, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. I, I'd ask that you bring the entire assembly to order. Um, and, and beyond that, I mean, this is obviously a conversation that might not fit into uh, a three-minute comment and a one-minute response. Uh, I would certainly be open to somebody making a motion to suspend the rules and allow this critically important discussion to continue. Um, I my point of order was to ask the president to please control the assembly. Uh, so I'm not prepared to make that motion, but if somebody would, I would certainly second it. Thank you, President Bourne. I'd like to continue with the comments and discussion that we have. Uh, there is uh, ample time for 
uh, continued questions about how we move forward. The superintendent still has the authority to make decisions about opening and closing spaces. Uh, that was authority granted to him by uh, this board uh, about a month ago. And uh, in addition, uh, I would remind commissioners that at any time, uh, should they want to recommend bringing forward a resolution for a different path in terms of how we manage our public spaces, um, they are welcome to do so, and such is their prerogative. Uh, and with that, I would like to continue, since I want to be consistent with the amount of time people have been given to speak, uh, I would like to continue with the speakers who are Point of um, able to speak program. here, and I'd like to go forward with Commissioner Meyer. Excuse me? Commissioner Myers. The I don't next get to speak. Piece. Oh, Commissioner Musich, did I, I just call on you? I don't think Commissioner Musich was next. Thank you, was, Commissioner though, Bourne. I will, I will go to Commissioner Musich. My apologies. Thank you, President um, Kogel. But I'm also rising I, to a point of inquiry, which I think is a privileged motion. Jesus. Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Kogel. Just, just my point of inquiry based on what you just said. If people wanted to bring forward a motion at any time right now, uh, would it be your interpretation that you would require a suspension of the rules for any, su for any such motion? We've been yeah. kind of inconsistent yes, on what we've it would done be. there in the past. It would be. So we would need a two-thirds majority to, to, Cor correct. to address the, yeah. our criti this critically important crisis. Thank you. Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. I appreciate being given my time to speak. Um, I have a clarifying question for Superintendent Bangora. Uh, is there a way to close down the regional parks? President Colgale, um, Commissioner Musich, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't know how that would happen at this time. The, the sheer size of the closure. Uh, would be very difficult. Um, I have not gone into, we have not explored what that would look like, but uh, I, I, I can't, I just, the size and the scope of it would be um, tremendous. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second clarifying question. Athletic fields are closed to use for team sports only, but are not closed generally for use. Is that correct? It's like if a family wants to go out and fly a kite, kick a ball around, play catch, play frisbee, they're able to do that in those spaces. Uh, they just can't play a pickup soccer game with their neighbors. Is that correct? President Gilgill, Commissioner Usage, correct. Okay. And our parks and our parks are open. All of our 180 parks are open for people to come and recreate and explore. And I've been banned from it, and I've been excluded from it. They can come to any of our parks with their family and then and fly a kite, kick a soccer ball to each other. Um, so that's always been open. Never okay. changed. We haven't closed green spaces, in other words. We have not. Okay, lovely. I just got quite a few emails letting me know that we had, and I was surprised by that. Um, so I don't know if maybe we need to refine the signage to, to make that a yes. bit more clear to folks or something, but um, it, it, it is a perception that people in the public yes. sphere have. So thank you. Well, That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner Meyer for the second time. Thank you. Just following up on what I was talking about before, so the Park Board is talking about doing some programming uh, for single tennis and basketball starting after the governor's executive order expires on uh, May 18th. And I just wanted to ask, like, can we actively lobby to let the governor start that earlier, or is there more than just the governor's executive order stopping, or is there some kind of staff consideration on that? Uh, uh, President uh, Kogel, Commissioner Meyer, um, we we went to that particular date because of the shelter and executive order. So that was the date that we just chose to follow because of the, um, the executive order um, specific language about um, going outside, you know, get air, go outside, but then go back home. It's a shelter and kind of an order, the executive order. Um, the order wasn't specific that said go and play basketball and, and tennis. It was about just going outside, um, going for a walk. Um, and so, um, I will take a look at that. I'll explore that to see if we can do something earlier. Um, I just sent an email or a text to um, uh, Director Mike Hom to just to ask the question. Commissioner French was asking the question, so I'm following up that also. So 
let me definitely take a look at that and see if there would be any concerns about, um, again, if we were just to do, um, like you said, single tennis or open up a court to, for a father and a daughter or somebody to come out and shoot a ball. Um, I will follow up on that. But I was just following the executive order that was put in front by the governor. So that was our guidance. Great. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to start those as early as we can. And then Tomorrow. Like, oh. <laughs> I will call. Okay. And then just a couple rapid fire responses to I think a couple other things that people have brought up. Um, I strongly discourage people from calling 911 on, on people around this. Like if, if there's really a problem with like a big gathering or something, you can call the customer service line, but it's, it's a problem to take up uh, 911 resources on this uh, when they've got a lot of the other things that they're dealing with. So that, that'd be my response on that. And then secondly, I just really hope that we don't close the regional park or any park. I mean, um, I don't think it's feasible and I don't think it would be good if it was. Thank you. Thank you, and Commissioner I, Meyer. And then Commissioner Meyer, can I just respond just to say that as far as um, one of the questions was, how do you, <coughs> Commissioner Severson was mentioning about how do you respond there, get, um, you know, uh, the same response is that they can call the executive order complaint, um, uh, complaint line, and also there's <coughs> customer service 311. Those would be the two best options to get, obviously, complaints um, around regional park systems. We have received a lot of those complaints. Um, I know there is data that, that tracks those, but um, they can definitely reach out to 311 or the uh, executive order complaint line. Um, I don't have the exact number for that, but those are two locations that you can reach out and, and uh, uh, do complaints about social distancing. Thank you, Superintendent Vangora, for um, that and for fielding the, the majority of these questions. Um, I think it's a variety of these uh, questions brought up are very important and the themes uh, around how we're caring for our most vulnerable uh, community members who are using our public spaces, um, what kinds of public spaces are open, how we manage those public spaces, who benefits from the use of those public spaces are critical questions as we are moving through this summer. Uh, and I, I believe that they are questions that uh, our staff and uh, fortunately also our board are grappling with on a daily basis. I think that uh, the approach that we are taking right now of being um, cautious about uh, how public spaces are used and monitoring the guidance that is coming out, and sometimes changing on a daily basis is very difficult to do and I think um, we have exercised caution while also balancing the need to ensure that people have healthy options for to be outside. Um, that's what we do. We provide safe spaces for people to be outside to the best of our ability in the public in the public realm. Um, to uh, the a couple of uh, items that I just want to uh, mention uh, briefly. Um, one uh, regarding uh, our regional park spaces and the closure of of, of uh, parkways. Uh, it's important that we continue to have. Uh, monitoring of data of how people are using that. We've already been doing that with our ambassador program for weeks um, and are getting ped counts as well. We'll talk more about that in a bit on the next resolution. So with that, I'd like to move on um, to the resolutions at hand. I'd like to ask for a motion on resolution 2020-199, which is a resolution approving policy governing leave for emergency responders employed by the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board during the COVID-19 public health emergency. So moved. Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, I'll ask the secretary to please. Sorry, uh, John, I'm trying, the President Kogel, I'm trying to raise my hand, I'm sorry. Yep. Okay, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. J just a really quick question on this, talking about the um, leave of our public employees that we're putting in harm, that are some of them are being put in harm's way during a, during a public health crisis. I, I, I'm just wondering if we can get some staff from the Minneapolis Health Department that could come and maybe speak on a broader variety of health related issues to the Minneapolis Park Board. I'm very appreciative of the staff that were here this evening. Uh, but it sounds like they're maybe all from the same unit of the health department are really only geared to 
partially answer some of the questions that came up tonight. Uh, so as we're looking at a lot of public health responses, it, it would be that we're relying on the Minneapolis Health Department for guidance with, including this resolution to some extent. It would be wonderful we could have um, greater representation from the Minneapolis Health Department at future meetings. So um, I, I don't know if that's a question that's directed to Ms. Ritchie or staff from the Health Department. Is that a commitment that can be made to the Minneapolis Park Board? Uh, President Kogel, uh, Commissioner Bourne, uh, this is Heidi Ritchie from the Mayor's Office. I am happy to participate in any meeting you'd like me at. Thank you, Ms. Ritchie. You're in the Mayor's Office, but not in the Health Department, correct? Correct. I guess, I guess I was asking if maybe you could help coordinate a broader array of staff members from the health department Absolutely. at our meeting. I will, I will point out that I am the um, policy director, but my portfolio includes public health, and I am an RN, and I have a public health nursing certification. And so we can have as many public health people as you want, but I, I think if you, um, if you will take me, I would like to be the person who is represented in those um, groups with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch Richie. I'd remind President Bourne to keep the conversation germane to the resolution, and we can work on coordinating who's at the meetings at a later time. President Kogel, respectfully, it was. The, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the our our uh, leave policy, our emergency leave policy, was done in coordination with other units of government, including the health department, as we're putting employees in health in harm's way. So the comment is. Respectfully, very much to me. Seeing no other hands raised, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on resolution 2020-199. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Commissioner French. I'm sorry. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. You have nine ayes. Uh, resolution 2020-199 carries. Uh, moving on to our next item, I'll ask for a motion on resolution 2020-200, which is a resolution amending the 2019, 2020, and 2021 capital improvement program to realign projects in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Do I have a motion? The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the resolution? Commissioner French. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm losing the Commissioner French. Commissioner French, you're uh, muted. On mute. I thought I got the hang. I thought I had the hang of this. Uh, I was, so I was trying to figure out. You know what? Never mind. I'll pass my question. It's okay. Thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, President Colgill. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the funding sources of the um, of the shifts. Um, quite a bit of our uh, quite a bit of our planning dollars come from um, come from O and M money, which the Minneapolis Park Board has discretion over. Uh, we that could be directed into general operating. It certainly makes sense that uh, there are quite a few projects on this list in both. President, uh, President Cogill's district and mine that are being delayed because the Southwest Master Plan is also being delayed. Um, but I'm I'm wondering, considering the significant expenses that we're taking with um, keeping the parkways open and some other uh, some other items, if it makes sense to just reallocate some of these delays outside of K 
capital for the for the time being. So, uh, can we talk a little bit about the funding sources, uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, the, of the projects that are being delayed? Uh, President Kogel and uh, Commissioner Bourne, actually, I'll defer to uh, Director uh, Arvidsson, who can respond to that directly. President Kogel, Com uh, Commissioner Bourne, I actually do have a very brief presentation um, that talks a little bit about funding sources and the purposes behind this, if that would be helpful. Oh, absolutely. Great, thank you, Secretary Ringgold. Um, so the, um, the idea here um, is to um, really think about the projects that we might be able to do in the context of the pandemic versus those projects that might be more difficult to do, primarily um, uh, with regard to community engagement. Um, and so if you could advance to the next slide. The, um, the, the basic um, uh, idea of the amendment is that some of the major projects um, which are large scale plan implementation projects in, in the parks uh, would move from 2019 and 2020 into the 2021 year. Whereas some of the play area projects and other simpler projects would move from 2021 into 2020. So a bit of a swap there. And then we would be able to increase rehabilitation funds in 19 and 20 and reduce them equivalently in 2021. Um, the reason for this primarily is that uh, we feel that the highly detailed multi-phase community engagement, so what we would call um, the involve and partner level of community engagement in the CE plans will be very difficult right now. However, the inform and consult community engagement is possible now. Uh, we've been starting to engage online and through some other methods, and we think that there's things that can be done. Projects like play areas, at the fields, courts, roofs, HVAC systems, sidewalks can move forward in the context of the pandemic but we feel that the large master plan implementations uh, can't at the moment because um, there's a more uh, robust engagement that's required. Almost all of these projects uh, within um, the CIP are actually funded by bonds. There are a couple that are funded by the uh, neighborhood capital levy, but that's considered um, under the ordinance as a match to the NPP 20 bonds. So these projects, um, really can't be repurposed into general park uses. They have to go to capital improvements um, or rehabilitation projects. So what this shift would do is it would actually allow us to keep asset management and planning staff working this year. Asset management staff do perform rehabilitation work under NPP 20. So by increasing those numbers in, in, in 2020, the asset management staff can uh, continue working on those projects that they're able to do. This shift also does keep local contractors and consultants working. Many of these um, through the target market program through the city are small businesses or disadvantaged businesses. Um, and uh, keeping these projects moving uh, does keep them uh, basically in, in business. In addition, it does allow for the continued improvement to the park system for the public. So we can take care of quite a few things um, in 2020, even without um, doing um, uh, the, the robust community engagement that comes along with the inform and consult levels for the large projects. We can replace more roofs, we can do more HVAC systems, we can take care of more sidewalks, we can do more restroom rehabilitation. Um, and that, that is a benefit to the public uh, in the long run and the short term. The next slide uh, really looks at some of the specificity of these projects. I'm not gonna read all these through, but as the discussion continues, we can go through them in some detail. This is a glimpse of what the CIP in terms of the neighborhood parks looks like right now. I've not listed all the projects in 2019, but in 2020 and 2021, those are all the projects that we have programmed in those CIP years. You notice that each year has a mix of those play projects, um, court projects, field projects, and also the major implementation projects. And on the next slide, I show the shift that's proposed by this amendment. So we would keep the additional seed money for Painter and Sibley in 2019 but we would relocate some of the other major projects shown in blue um, to 2021 and then move the, um, uh, the play projects, the court projects, the field projects, which need um, lower levels of community engagement into 2020. 
So you can see that the new 2020 lineup would involve almost entirely play projects, play area projects. And then we would increase the rehabilitation. You see that down there on the bottom line. We would add $1.7 million to the rehabilitation fund. And again, those are all bond funds. So they do need to go to significant capital improvements in the park. And then the inverse would happen in 2021. We would reduce the amount of rehabilitation. And again, we believe this allows us to spend money effectively this year um, and put that out into the community doing good work um, and, uh, and changes the way that we do community engagement um, in a manner that's more um, appropriate for uh, the experience that we're having today with the pandemic. On the last slide are just a couple of other items that are included um, uh, in this amendment. Uh, we're suggesting um, advancing some of the capital levy funds for service centers. Um, a portion of the general fund money that would be dedicated for service centers in 2020 would be returned to the general fund for other park uses. We did look at the CIP to try to find line items where there are general fund monies included, and this is one particular spot where we could um, bring some money back into the general fund. Uh, we're also suggesting redirecting a parks and trails funded project to um, a capital project that's existing at the Kenilworth Channel. Uh, we think doing a promotional project on transit, which would have involved ambassadors and one-on-one -on -one contact, is really impossible right now. And this funding is nearing its expiration. So we want to repurpose that back into the project from which it originally came, which is the Kenilworth Channel Rehabilitation Project, which is currently underway. Um, so that's the basics of this amendment. And I would be happy now to take any questions that the commissioners might have. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Ms. Director Arvidson. Commissioner Just Bourne. Clarification, President Kogel, we were, uh, was that my first time speaking or was that, at, or was that getting the staff presentation that was already prepared? Uh, since that's what you requested, I think that's fair and we will start your three minutes now. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So uh, just a point of clarification, Director Ardvitsen, um, the, the funds in particular for Painter, you said that those are primarily bond, bonded dollars, or did I, did I miss that? Um, Commissioner, uh, President Kogo, Commissioner Born, uh, that's correct, those are bond dollars. So those are used on capital or don't? Uh, we don't have as much discretion with that. Uh, President Kogel, uh, Commissioner Bourne, that's correct. And, but, but we could put them into ADA improvements, additional like general rehab and maintenance. Um, President Bourne, uh, sorry, President Kogel, Commissioner Bourne, um, that is correct. And that's okay. one of the elements um, of this shift is that we would increase the amount of rehabilitation funds um, in 2020 to do exactly those kinds of things throughout the park system. Right, and I and I saw that, and I'm appreciative of uh, of that increase. When I also look at the document, it, it looks like pretty pretty close to an offset amount from Painter Park and an increase in a capital project in Northeast Rec Center. Am I re am I reading that right? Uh, Secretary Ringo, can you go back to the slide immediately preceding this? I'm going to pull up another document on my own screen so that I can make sure that I understand your question. Uh, Commissioner Bourne, you're seeing a shift. I'm looking at the supporting document that, that was in the packet, the, the amended CIP, and now I, I have a problem pulling it up here. Um, actually, um, we can go to that document. The last few slides of this presentation do include that document as kind of a safety valve. So, um, sorry, Secretary Ringgold, I made you go backward, but if you want to go forward, um, these are maybe a little small, but um, we can possibly we can possibly get there. Um, if you could point it, you're probably going to find it faster than I am. But there's a there's a reduction in painter, and I thought I saw an addition to Northeast Rec Center. So the reduction in painter is actually a shift of painters 2020 money to 2021. We right. haven't reduced any project costs. The Northeast um, project 
Uh, the Northeast um, Recreation Center project is actually an athletic fields improvement project that we had planned in 2021, and it would move to 2020. The reason for those two project shifts has more to do with their project type than where they're located. Um, the Painter project would be a major first phase implementation of the master plan. Um, we need to do engagement around that at the um, at the involved level of engagement typically, uh, which requires um, significant um, uh, community conversation, which we feel is difficult um, in this context. However, um, rehabilitating um, athletic fields based on an adopted master plan, there's less community decision-making that happens in that context. So that would be more of um, a consult level of engagement, which we do believe that we can do in this context through other means. So that's why those um, projects have uh, changed years under this amendment. So if the if the board were to say take the funding from Painter this year and put it into either ADA or general uh, uh, general repair and uh, maintenance, and then do the project in 2021, we would then have a deficit in 2021 because we'd have two project we'd have two projects in 2021. We'd have Northeast and we'd have Northeast and Painter. President Coville, Commissioner Bourne, do you, do you mean if the Northeast project were not moved, but the Painter were? So if, yeah, because I, I think it makes perfect sense to push Painter back. The, okay. I, I'm wondering if the best use of funds is to move another project forward or to fix broken stuff. And to and which we never have enough money of, and we have a lot of closed rec centers right now where it's a really opportune time to go in and do like basic repairs on on facilities that uh, that I'm sure that fund will have a have a shortage. But if I'm understanding what you're saying right, and so we didn't move northeast, we still delayed Painter. Then next year we've got a we've got a big delta if we spent all the money that we allocated for painter in in either ADA or or general rehab. Pre President Cogill, Commissioner Bourne, um, that uh, change would be possible. The effect would be that we would have a still higher number of rehabilitation um, in 2020 and a yet lower number of rehabilitation in 2021. And the problem that that would create is that we do have asset management staff um, that are funded in part by the rehabilitation dollars. So in order to preserve those staffing levels, we do need to retain a certain amount of rehabilitation dollars in the 2021 year in order to have enough of that kind of work for them to do. So what we've tried to do with this is to balance that and so that bottom line number of about $1.7 million remaining in rehab in 2021 is about as low as we feel comfortable going without impacting um, asset management staffing levels in that year. Does that make sense? And in 2021, we could also increase rehab from another source though. We would just have to address it in 2021. President Cogill, uh, Commissioner Bourne, you could you could increase rehab from another source, okay. but that source would essentially be another project in the CIP that would convert to rehabilitation funds, meaning yeah. that that project would have to be delayed into 2022, which would cause the delay of another project from 22 to 23. And the CIP would sort of cascade forward that way. There would be a delay each year in order to accomplish that. This amendment actually um, delays uh, certain projects from 20 to 21 and advances others in the opposite direction, but it has no impact on the CIP beyond the 2021 year. Okay, I will uh, wait. Uh, I'll wait for a follow-up. That, that that does clear that up. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. Uh, so, Director Arvidsson, uh, does this increase in the renovation funding allow for projects that would require rec centers to be closed? Um, how do I phrase this? <laughs> I 
I typed it out so it makes sense and then I didn't read it right. Um, essentially what I'm asking is, does this increase allow us to complete projects that would otherwise have to close rec centers in this time when the pandemic has closed them for us? Uh, President Kogil, Commissioner Music, um, that's entirely possible. We would have to look at that on a project by project basis. Not every rec center rehabilitation closes the rec center, um, but this is certainly an opportunity to do some major rehabilitation projects with um, uh, less impact to the public because the centers are closed. Okay, so I would love if we could um, look at the pending projects we have on that list and see if maybe we need to re-rank them um, with that information in mind so that we can uh, take advantage of the fact that we already have these buildings closed for this other purpose. Because uh, I think people, once we do open them again, are really going to want to use them. And if we have to then close them for a rehab project, they'll be sad. So if we could uh, turn the lemons into lemonade, that'd be lovely. Uh, the next question I had was about construction costs. Are we seeing reductions in construction costs as the job market has softened? Um, President Kogil, Commissioner Musich, um, I might turn that one over to either Assistant Superintendent Schroeder um, or Director Swenson would deal more directly with that. Okay. President Kogil uh, and uh, um, Commissioner Musich, uh, Director Swenson and I were just talking about that today on, on a call. Uh, we have been receiving of late projects that have had more bidders and uh, bids coming in on budget. Um, so we suspect that um, we will see that trend continuing. Um, and and to, to the extent that we can continue to take advantage of, of uh, rehabilitation projects, especially smaller ones, that we can be using smaller contractors, CMP contractors, we think we're going to continue to see that happening. Okay, wonderful. Um, the, the last thing I'd like to address is um, Sibley and Key Wadens. These are two projects in my district that uh, were initially funded in 2019 as part of the CIP that people are really hoping that we would start doing engagement last year. Um, I told them because of staffing levels, we just weren't unable to get to those, but we're hoping to get to them in 2020. Um, what assurance can you give that these projects not only will be designated in, for funding in 2021, but that engagement will actually start in that year as well uh, so that these projects can actually get put in the ground at some point? Um, President Kogil, Commissioner Musich, um, I, um, I don't want to speak entirely for Director Swenson um, and the staffing um, that he um, dedicates to certain projects, but it seems to me, um, and this is typical in our operating structure, that projects that have been previously delayed into a different CIP year are prioritized for staffing um, because there's the understanding that we have had to kind of alter a promise to the community. So I would expect um, that sort of in, in return for being able to advance the work of the organization in terms of capital and rehabilitation, um, we understand that there's sacrifice in, in some communities that will see their projects delayed. And I think we would make every effort to get to those projects um, uh, as priority projects. Okay, thank you. That was all I had. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Um, I'm seeing no other hands raised at this time. Uh, thank you uh, to Director Arvinson and to Assistant Superintendent Schroeder for the work on uh, this. I think it's a smart move for us to make this amendment, and uh, I will be supporting uh, this. Um, at this time, I'll be asking the Secretary to please take the roll on Resolution 2020-200. Commissioner Bourne. I'll abstain. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Commissioner. Uh, aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. 
Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. You have seven ayes, one abstain, and one absent. Uh, the resolution carries. Moving on, I'll ask for a, um, a motion on resolution 2020-201, uh, noting that uh, the amount has been amended. Uh, the, um, the updated version was sent to commissioners just after noon today. Uh, resolution 2020-201, a resolution amending the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board Capital Improvement Program approving the 2020 allocation of $92,540 to the Memorial for Survivors of Sexual Violence proposed to be located in Boom Island Park, a part of Central Mississippi Riverfront Regional Park from the St. Anthony West neighborhood portion of the Parkland Dedication Fund. So moved. Move. Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on uh, the resolution? I know we have maybe some guests here on this. Um, I don't know if there needs to be a presentation. Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Yeah, um, this is something I did community engagement on uh, with the St. Anthony West Neighborhood Organization. And uh, there was very strong support for this um, from both the board uh, of the neighborhood organization and from people who commented um, from the broader public. Uh, to get this project over the finish line. Um, and this um, allocation um, goes to uh, things like landscaping, uh, importing of uh, planting soils and pavers and other things that I believe are appropriate for us using park dedication funds on. Uh, if there are any questions, we do have representatives um, from uh, both the neighborhood organization um, and from uh, the supporters of the project who are available to speak to it. Are you, are you asking for somebody to speak to the? Nope, I'm oh. saying that if other commissioners are interested in that, they're available. Oh, got it. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Are there any other commissioners wishing to speak? Any other commissioners? Any others? Um, well, seeing none, uh, thank you uh, to the commissioners who have uh, spent a lot of time uh, advocating for this and to Ms. Super and all of the folks that worked so hard to um, bring this forward and uh, to Commissioner Meyer for his continued engagement and leadership on this. Um, at this time, I'll ask the secretary to please take the role on resolution 2020-201. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. The resolution carries. Um, on to our uh, final resolution of the full board meeting. Uh, I'll ask for a motion on resolution 2020-202, a resolution granting the superintendent authority to approve directly expenditures of up to $250,000 for the procurement of goods and services related to parkway closures and extending all current parkway closures through June 7th. So moved. There's been a, a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's been a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Uh, com Commissioner Bourne. I, I think Commissioner Forney's uh, uh, hand icon came up before mine did. I would okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Commissioner Bourne, you're mistaken. It did not. Uh, thank you, President. Cogill, um, if staff can just give a report, I know it's in the uh, background materials, but just what is the source of funding for this $250,000? Superintendent? 
Vice President Cogill, Commissioner, um, Commissioner Bourne. Um, I'm going to defer and have, and have uh, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder to give some background around uh, the cost. President Cogill, uh, Commissioner Bourne, we're still working on um, the full complement of, of, of funding for this, and we are, I've been working with IG, IGRA um, Administrator uh, Gokemeyer on trying to uh, determine additional funding sources, and we may have some step forward next week. We've been working with, um, I've been working with uh, Shane Stenzel and potentially getting some sponsorships from, from uh, entities that uh, would normally um, provide um, sponsorships for races or events on the parkways. So um, we, we know that won't cover the higher cost of this. So as we look at this, we've been uh, looking at um, operations and maintenance dollars. We've been looking at a whole host of funding sources. We don't have one defined for you today, um, but it's one of the things that as we've been going through the 2020 uh, and looking ahead and looking at the budget for this year with with, uh, with COVID-19 problems, we've been looking at where the sources uh, might be coming from. So while we don't have a funding source defined immediately, we are looking at alternatives to traditional funding sources. And um, quite frankly, I, I would defer to um, uh, Director Weissman on what some of the traditional funding, internal funding sources might be, even though we haven't committed to any of those this, at this point. Director Wiseman. Thank you, President Cogill, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, the only other, other non-traditional funding uh, that I'm also looking at, at least for the initial road closures, is through the FEMA reimbursement disaster relief. Um, we are just in the beginning of pursuing that. We have been notified that there is a um, meeting that will be held next week uh, to start like an applicant process for FEMA disaster relief for um, jurisdictions within Hennepin County. So I am pursuing that as well as uh, O&M um, lottery proceeds that Assistant Superintendent Michael Schroeder has also indicated. Uh, Director Wiseman, is this, so last, at our last meeting you had told us a story that none of us wanted to hear I about, I think somewhere along the lines of like a $3 million deficit. I guess I did too when I, when I was, uh, some yeah, yeah. If good folks could please uh, mute their uh, mics so that Commissioner Bourne can speak. Uh, just a was, like, reminder. Job ever. We didn't have to be there till like nine o'clock. The uh, I'll keep going so we don't hear their private conversation. <laughs> Maybe I can talk a lot. You can. Uh, you are muted. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Um, so you had projected something along the lines of a $3 million deficit. Was this $250,000 expenditure included in that three million, potential $3 million deficit, or is this, are we digging the hole deeper by doing this? President Cogill and Commissioner Bourne, I will be providing a, a new up financial update on May 20th. Um, at the time of April 22nd, um, I did not include the 250000 We had, um, at that point, estimated, I believe, 150000 um, So it does increase that amount. But we are adjusting our financial pro projections, as I've talked about, as we've implemented uh, the strategies with the hiring freeze and the spending freeze and now budgetary leave. Uh, so I will have some updates for you and our deficit um, will not be in the $3 million range when I speak to you in um, at the next board meeting. Well, good work there. Um, but we're, but this was not included as an expense in 
our last conversation, we just found some additional cost savings to get the total amount down. But this is a $250,000 expense that was added to the added to our list of things to be concerned about. I'm seeing a head nod, I think. I, okay. Um, I, I certainly don't, I, I mean, I obviously have some reservations with spending this much. Um, I, I also have some additional reservations going back to our conversations earlier this evening where, again, there are more people not social distancing on the grand rounds than there are on any basketball court in the city or all the basketball courts or all the tennis courts. And our response up to this date is to spend a quarter million dollars to allow more opportunities for people not to social distance in one user set of our park system and to take another user set and close all of their amenities down. I mean, $250,000 would buy a lot of ambassadors on basketball courts and allow a lot of basketball courts to be open under very close supervision. Um, so I, I really question the wisdom of digging the hole deeper and not providing resources for all of our park users and only for a certain subset. Um, if there were some sort of amendment to come along with this to provide additional funding for ambassadors for basketball courts and tennis courts, I like that would make a lot more sense to me because we are also, with things being closed, we are also spending less. So if we weren't spending 250 here, we'd be spending it on something else. But it's just some of the coded issues around this are really problematic to me. Commissioner uh, Forney is next. Are we still live here? Uh, yeah, I'm Commissioner Forney, are you able to? Yeah, it, President Colgill? Yep. Um, Commissioner Forney? Up? Vice President Vita? We can't hear him. I can't I hear. I think we lost a whole bunch of people. Yeah, mm. I think so. Well, I we can, can hear you on this side. Him. You are unmuted. We can't hear you. Can you hear, can you hear us at this point? Now. All now right. we can. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Commissioner uh, Forney. Thank you, President Colio. Um, I, I think it was um, Commissioner Muse, I think, put it very well when she asked the question about can we close up our regional parks? And I, I think we all are quite cognizant of the fact that we can't. And so the road closures are around our regional parks, and I feel as if um, they have been successful. Um, and I'm saying that from the standpoint of uh, the numerous emails that um, I've received, and I'm assuming most everybody else has as well. I've also reached out to all of the ward council members and asked them what um, their constituents have been telling them, their opinions, et cetera. And um, I would say that it's been um, um, successful. Um, I would say two consistent things that I have heard, and that is number one, don't change it up. In other words, don't make a little change over here and don't make a little, you know, in other words, this week by week or change by change, um, it, whatever. It's just change is hard for people, okay? So um, people are appreciative. The thing, though, I am hearing consistently, and that is the use of the parkways for bicyclists. And that messaging is not getting through, and we have got to do something about that. Um, one uh, constituent wrote, you know, putting big orange letters, you know, on the asphalt and everything, only bicyclists. Please, 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 can we do this? Put up signs in the middle of the parkway saying five miles per hour, in other words, indicating only for um, pedestrians. But that, I think, is the most serious, you know, concern that people have. Um, and the social distancing, I agree. You know, there are a lot of times that it's being breached. But on the majority, I believe that people have been very, very respectful of it. Um, I'm seeing more and more people wearing masks. I'm very appreciative of that. Um, and I just want to say, hopefully there will be other places that will be opening up, such as the Arboretum. I mean, the fact that they're allowing people to drive through, hopefully will take the pressure off of us 
and people will be going elsewhere. But um, I will support this um, resolution and uh, applaud staff for being as creative as they are, and thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Forney. Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Uh, I was taken aback by uh, the sticker shock. Um, didn't have any idea beforehand that it cost this much to rent our cones and uh, barricades. And I've learned more about the uh, manual and uniform traffic control devices than I ever wanted to. Um, I understand uh, that we used to own our own um, cones and signs, and, and we, I, I discussed that with Assistant Superintendent uh, Schroeder. And I was just wondering, uh, Mr. Schroeder, if you, if you could speak to the, some of the things that, that you and I talked about, because we had a lot of questions from the public about it. And I'd just like to explain what, why it is we, we no longer own our own and, and what the obstacles to owning our own would be. President Kogil and Mr. Meyer, I could recap uh, briefly the um, information that I shared uh, at a pretty high level with uh, Commissioner um, Meyer when he asked about um, the costs kind of the cost benefit of our owning our own equipment versus renting as we have been doing. Um, the type three barricades that we've been using, um, when you look at a, a vendor like Granger, who would be a, a vendor that we would typically go to, most contractors would go to that kind of a vendor. Um, a type three barricade, which are the large kind of panel, vertical panels with the three boards are just slightly over $400 a piece. Uh, the two delineators, which are the tall kind of candlestick looking objects that divide the travel lanes from the pedestrian lanes in our closures, range anywhere from $60 to $90 uh, a piece. If we were to look at, at buying those for West, for, um, West River Parkway, uh, the cost using the, using the numbers of equipment that we have out there would be about $1.7 million. If we were to look at, uh, I think the other example that I did was Lake of the Isles. The Lake of the Isles closures using our own equipment um, would cost us a, around 700 some thousand dollars. And that uh, doesn't put us in a position of having to store them or deploy them. Um, and um, th so, so when we look at it, unless we're gonna be using them uh, consistently, like every day of the year, it really doesn't make sense to have that much stock for that much cost uh, um, purchasing them ourselves. Um, how, how much would it make sense to, to own some of our own, like for the events that we do? I don't know if we have Shane Stencil for that, but um, like, I, I, I understand that we couldn't buy all of, of the signs and, and cones that we have need for right now, but could we buy enough for our own events? President Kogil um, and Commissioner Meyer, a smaller amount where where we would um, be closing a full a full parkway for an event might be more reasonable to to purchase, but there may be uh, other ways of accommodating those kinds of closures. Um, Mr. Sensel and I have talked about that, and um, when we are when we hope to be moving uh, next year into a study of our parkways, uh, it's one of the topics we look at. How could we effectively closed parkways without having to deploy lots of temporary barriers, possibly with um, ornamental gates or other things that would be closed when we're having events. So there are other ways of looking at it. Certainly having a more limited number of devices um, that would be only used for uh, parkway closures for events as possible. Um, but even that, um, I, I think uh, Mr. Stenzel and I have talked about the park board used to have parade boards, which are those more small horse looking objects, um, which didn't work very well, and now they're not even allowed uh, as a closure device. So that, that, that's the other thing uh, where I run the manual and uniform traffic control devices. Whatever devices we use have to comply with that, with that uh, manual. And if we buy a bunch of stuff in five years from now, uh, there's a change, we're stuck with a bunch of outdated equipment. Right. Uh, so given all this information, uh, you know, I, I would say wherever possible, either, you know, we need to close the parkways to vehicle access altogether or not at all uh, to reduce those expenses as, as much as 
um, we can. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is, is that I, I've gotten just so many uh, complaints about the way we're allocating the space, that it's not intuitive to people. And I understand that it's, a, it's going to be a difficult shift uh, to move from where staff started originally. It's going to be kind of like how Sweden switched from driving on uh, the left side of the road to the right side of the road. Like we'll, we'll need an effort to do it. But I, I feel that we should do that because we're having real problems. As Commissioner Forney says, people are complying with it. I mean, we can go one direction or the other. We can either double down on, on the path that staff originally chose. But I think it would be better uh, if we switched to the distribution that is more intuitive to people uh, the distribution that St. Paul and other cities are using, uh, which is where the, the sidewalk and the bike lane are dedicated to pedestrians and then the portion of the road that is closed uh, to vehicles is open to cyclists, rollerblading, skateboarding. Um, so I'm, I'm not making the motion right now, but I'm going to read the motion uh, that I would like to make after other commissioners are, are uh, done with their first round. Um, and I can put this in the chat if that's allowed. Um, resolved for the duration that parkways are temporarily closed to vehicle access during the COVID-19 ep epidemic. Uh, the Board of Commissioners directs staff to designate all off-street sidewalk and bike lanes on the affected parkways to pedestrians and to designate uh, the portion of roadway closed to vehicles to cycling, skateboarding, and rollerblading as soon as this shift can be adequated, adequately uh, communicated to the public, uh, which I understand would take a while the signs themselves would take about um, a week and, you know, but I, I feel that it's a shift that we should make. We can't hear you. President sorry, Trudeau. sorry about that, Commissioner Musich. You you may speak thank now. You. Thanks. Uh, thank you, President Kogel. Um, I'd like to know if there have been any collisions reported on the parkways between pedestrians and wheeled users. Superintendent, do you um, have President any knowledge? Kogel and Commissioner Musich, I have not heard of any collisions at this time. Um, I have not had reports that come through my email or um, through um, our uh, safety uh, through uh, people huddles area. I have not heard anything at this time personally. We had one this afternoon. It's in your email. Okay. Okay. And um, what what plan is there in place to better educate the public about where they should be um, on the trail network? if we extend this through June 7th. For President Coville, Commissioner Muses, this is uh, Michael Schroeder. Um, as I've been talking with Commissioner Meyer about any changes that might happen, we've talked about the need for uh, a publicity campaign to make sure we get it right because this would be a significant sudden change potentially. And I've suggested that we, what we want to do is reach out to our partners like the um, in the bicycle community to make sure that they're understanding what we're doing, that they can help communicate through their channels uh, to the bicycling community. And then we would be in a process of uh, definitively re-signing and um, even taking, uh, taking a look at some of the suggestions uh, that have been made tonight about pavement markings that could be more demonstrative of how the parkway could be used for pedestrians or for bicycles. Okay, thank you. And how much have we spent on the signage that indicates the current configuration of usage up to this point? President Kugel, um, Commissioner Musich, I believe um, Director Summers could probably give you a better answer, but I believe it's in the neighborhood of a few handfuls of thousands of dollars, probably five to ten thousand dollars. Okay, so we would spend another five to ten thousand dollars to print up new signage if we were to change the configuration um, of where people are meant to be on the on the trails and roadways. President Kovac, Mr. Meyer, that and we would be changing some of the signage that we're currently using on the barricades as well. Okay, and. <laughs> 
I guess, so I appreciate where Commissioner Meyer is coming from with wanting to reduce confusion and try to make things intuitive for people, but I've also been receiving messages from folks that um, are, that have impaired immune systems or they're multi a multi-generational household where they feel like there's enough space on the parkway for them to be able to walk um, pushing their um, family member in their wheelchair because they know that they can create that bubble around themselves of space. Um, and they don't really have the ability to step off the trail to move away if people are not distancing from them. Whereas on the parkway, there's plenty of space for them to roll further away in a different direction. Um, I guess I would want us to really seriously consider the impacts of the ability for those users to be able to continue to use this space if we were to make the change that's being recommended um, in the motion that, that Commissioner Meyer would like us to consider because I, I think we're effectively driving those users out of the, out of the system entirely um, by making the change to have the parkways be bikes only. Um, and then my last question is for Superintendent Bangora. Uh, do we lack the number of full-time staff required to provide ambassadors to staff closed amenities that we're proposing the reopening of? Uh, President Colby, Commissioner Usage. Um, and the question is, are we lacking staff for um, yeah, to be ambassador. basketball, those tennis, those kind of fields. Exactly. It, it is, yeah, um, it's a good question. Um, right now, I know Assistant Superintendent uh, Fox has been working through the numbers. Um, what we need, because if we look at, we start to kind of do uh, Red Plus, for example, right? We look at those 13 to 14 sites, and we're looking at um, phasing back into uh, basketball and tennis and fields. And so we are dispersing our staff back to sort of this scaling um, to our programs, and so it is a challenge. Um, and we're, um, even when we have around the system in our golf courses, around the lakes, so, um, you know, we're gonna move back to that piece, we're gonna get there, but yes, we have, it, it's a challenge the number of staff we have. Uh, but we will have, we will adapt right now to what we have in phase one. We have the staff that are going to engage or activate those programs. As it starts to build up and we start doing more programming, it's gonna be a challenge with the number of staff we have. But, um, you know, we're gonna, we'll make, we'll make it work. Okay, thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner Bourne, uh, oh, wait, sorry, Commissioner French uh, for the first time. Oh uh, yeah, uh, this, is, this is tough for me. This is this is this is really hard. I, I don't I don't I don't want kids gathering at basketball courts, but I also don't want folks gathering around our parkways. So I believe this is a issue of fairness, and I'm I'm quite and this is a very very popular idea that a lot of folks in the city actually like, and I've gotten tons of emails uh, congratulating me or. or thanking me for doing this, which I am i don't know how to take because I'm not really encouraging this. I think people should use their neighborhood parks. I'll, I'll, I'll stick to that. I'll still say we should use our neighborhood parks. We should not be gathering in our regional parks. Uh, we should not be creating space for people to gather. We should not be creating space for people to go hang out. And I'm gonna tell you something, I, I, I at least twice or three times a week, I, I pass, I go to the parkways and check it out. I don't live too far from it. And more often than that, I'm seeing people gathering, having hammock parties and little picnics and stuff. And I would be really, really curious to see how many complaints we got on folks who are not socially distant in um, in our regional parks. It's, it's really odd to, that we have the statistics exactly how many people were uh, complaining about folks in our neighborhood parks but we don't have any numbers about people who are complaining about uh, folks not socially distant in our regional parks. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, folks who look like me are disproportionately uh, impacted. And I think that's what's happening. I, I think people have a political agenda uh, and, and that's fine. I think some of the political agenda is, is great. I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm for a lot of it. But right now, I, I believe the hurt is disproportionate right now. And we need to really think about keeping everybody safe. And so I, I, I really, this one is a tough one for me. So 
So I'll, I'll vote later. You'll see my vote later. Thank you, Commissioner uh, French. Uh, Commissioner, or Vice President Vita for the first time. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, I guess I'm concerned as well about folks that are um, in the regional parks and, you know, maybe not social distancing at all times, but I'm more concerned about, you know, kids that are playing at basketball courts and going home and, you know, infecting their aunties and their grandmas and their parents. Um, all the data we see, people like me, people who look like me are dying of COVID-19 in higher rates than anyone else, any of these other communities. So, I mean, there's decisions that have to be made around how people gather at the parkways, but they're also, I mean, we, we see what's happening with kids transferring this virus to their parents and to, you know, multi-generational households. So I, I do want us to make sure that, you know, we're creating space for folks to walk at regional parks I can't say if those people live in those neighborhoods or not, I don't know. I have seen people walking close to each other. I've also witnessed people social distancing. But what I don't want us to do is uh, put an even heavier burden on a community that's all, on communities that's already underserved, meaning communities of color and allowing opportunities for the virus to spread faster and therefore um, you know, we know that these communities care and, and other things associated with the virus will not be addressed like some of our uh, neighbors and more affluent neighborhoods. That's it for me. Thank you, Vice President. Um, Commissioner Bourne for the second time. Thank you, President Cogill. I had a mic issue uh, a minute ago, and I think this was the answer, but how much have we spent so far on the closures? Uh, Superintendent. Uh, President Cogill, Commissioner uh, Bourne, um, I have the numbers. I know that um, uh, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder has numbers that he can walk through, uh, specifically to the first resolution that was the two weeks and the three weeks, and so he can give us specific to the numbers. And again, it's based on scale and what we can get for um, cost reduction. So, um, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, if you could give uh, some of the numbers, I would appreciate it. President Kogo, uh, Commissioner Bourne, uh, the numbers through um, the 4th of May uh, totaled $128,000 and change. Um, to get us through this evening, um, it's right around $140,000. Um, and this is 250 more, right? Um, or this is up to 250 is our new total. Co correct. And uh, when if this were to be extended through June 7th, our vendor has already told us that we would be receiving a um, a discount for a longer time of service for the devices that have been deployed, and that would bring our total through June 7th um, to $181,000. Um, and and if you were to, we couldn't, we would gain that retroactively if we extend through June 7th. Um, otherwise, we would be at the $140,000 uh, mark if we were to uh, be removing them tomorrow. So so through June 7th is only 100. Eighty. If we approve this, that that's correct. There's 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 a a, a reduction um, in in cost that is uh, fairly significant um, for having them deployed for a longer period of time. So, uh, th thank you, Assistant Superintendent. Um, how much have we spent on the? Uh, how much have we? How much are we planning on spending on the basketball and tennis program that you're talking about, uh, Superintendent Pangora? Yeah, President Cogio, Commissioner Bourne, uh, we're getting those numbers put together right now. Assistant Superintendent Cox is going to be spending or doing an analysis of what it's going to be costing us to do not only a social distancing program but our virtual programs, the number of hours and time that staff are out in the field, and specifically shifting their time not to just being ambassadors but to actually do the programs. So we will get those numbers for you to kind of reflect what the cost will be as we expand from phase one and phase two of our deployment of programming uh, within all of our parks and having people specifically doing programming and, uh, you know, not only with basketball and tennis, 
but also the social distancing program, uh, activating our fields, um, doing all the programs that we will be increasing uh, in the next several months. And so we're getting a cost analysis of that to reflect what the um, number of hours and staff and uh, cost for the programming we will be doing um, at our park throughout the city. Okay. Um, number two, Commissioner Bourne. Then, uh, thank you, Superintendent. Um, I, I think we are, hearing that this, home, hearing it's only going to cost 180 through June 7th, I, I think everybody here knows what the next step, step in the stance is and knows the emails we're going to start getting around June 1st, if not sooner. So if we're going to spend 250000 how long can we go how much longer can we go past June 7th? I mean, why don't we just have the conversation right now instead of having this comment? Like, again, we all know what the next step in the dance is. Um, okay, thank, thank you, uh, President Bourne. I, I would, or it, that, that's Commissioner a question, Pre President Colgill. Is that, that a question for the superintendent? Um, I, I guess it seems the, like it's a board it's action. It's a question and if, to whoever would like to, either the president or the superintendent or the motion maker. So it's certainly up to the board if they would like to provide uh, a different uh, date uh, on the ending of the parkway closures. Um, I, I would move to amend the resolution to fully expend up to two, uh, fully expend $250,000 for a road closure beyond June 7th. Is that the resolution that you, is that the final language that you'd like to have a road closure? To, to extend, uh, to extend all current parkway closures beyond June 7th. Beyond okay, so no so the final. Intent, the intent of the motion, the intent of the amendment is let's get this as far as the two hundred fifty thousand dollars will go, which sounds like it could probably get us to the end of June. I, I would support the intent of that language. I'm not sure the language is is nailed down just yet. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, if you'd like to draft from the dais, I would accept it all as a friendly amendment. I was going to ask you to do it. <laughs> I would move a resolution granting the superintendent the authority to approve direct expenditures of $250,000 for the procurement of goods and services related to parkway closures and extending all current parkway closures through the exhaustion of the $250,000 allocated. Okay. Is that a separate resolution or is that in this one? I'm amending this resolution. Okay, so I'll second that as a resolved clause. Uh, an amendment has been made and seconded. Um, I have many hands raised. I am wondering if they are to the amendment. I, I, I'd like to speak to okay. the amendment. Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you. Um, the, again, we all know what the next step in the dance is. I am very, I question the wisdom of this too. I hope that we see a plan come back for some of our other, um, for some of our other amenities, uh, especially in some of our least served communities where we're spending at least as much intellectual capital and financial capital on serving them in a time of crisis. Um, I'm not interested in having this conversation again passed through, past what the, uh, where $250,000 gets us. But um, superintendent, I would hope during this time, you'd come, come back with an equally ambitious plan for some of our least served communities. And I like the work that you've been doing so far, um, but let's spend, uh, let's spend an additional to a, like, it sounds like what, it sounds like what I'm hearing with the tennis and basketball programs are a redeployment of already allocated resources. Um, I heard from Director Wiseman that our deficit is going to be shrinking. I'd be willing to go back to that same $3 million number to make sure that we're spending an additional $250,000 for some of our most disadvantaged families during this time. But I, I just want to get this, like, let's spend the $250,000 because that's 
we're going to be taking this vote in, again in a couple of weeks anyway, and we all know how it's going to go. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bourne. Um, to the amendment, I have Commissioner French. I'm going to, I don't, I'm good. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner French. To the amendment, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Um, so I uh, definitely also support allocating additional funds for uh, basketball, tennis, and other um, activities for other people. Um, a, a couple of things that I just wanted to correct about this. Um, the amount would be 180000 as long as they go with, um, okay, uh, as long as they go with uh, the full closures on, on the sections that they highlighted in the staff report, they said full closure of Cedar Lake Parkway, uh, full closure of East Today Matoska, and uh, nearly full closure of West River Parkway, which I understand would need to still allow for vehicle access between 27th and Lake Street. Um, but I, I hope that we go through those and I, uh, you know, we, we could perhaps do an amendment to, to specify that. Um, but otherwise, if you didn't do that, then my understanding is that it would come up to $210,000 or something around there. Um, but I definitely agree that we should try to figure out ahead of time um, how far we're going to do this instead of making these adjustments every few weeks. Um, my initial thought was to look at you know, a climate calendar and try to figure out how long uh, is, the, uh, is there going to be an increased demand um, for social distancing. And I think it would be basically until you get you know, below 70 degrees. Um, in talking with Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, and he suggested Labor Day, um, because that's about when you would get that temperature decrease, and also when the schools would open up again if they did. Um, but I'm also sensitive to the expense um, when we're talking about laying people off. Uh, so I think this approach is a, is a pretty good one um, to, to set the amount that we want to allocate for it. And then I would just also note that it would help build the case uh, to other partners. Uh, you know, uh, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder talked about that some, about some of the other organizations that might be interested in donating to this. And then it'll be easier to say, like, once we've set the dollar amount that we're going to give, that if you would make a donation on top of that, then that'll make it last however many extra days. Um, so I'm, I'm supportive of, of this amendment and uh, urge other commissioners to vote for it as well. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, Commissioner Musich to the amendment. Thank you, President Kogel. Uh, so I have things I'd like to talk about on the main main motion, but uh, as well, but the this gets to the question I was trying to ask earlier: is what are the benchmarks that determine when we stop closing parkways? Uh, for use for other purposes than driving. Uh, right now, we're just extending it and extending it and extending it because we feel there's a need for social distancing, right? So what's the benchmark that says we no longer need to provide this space and we can reopen the parkways uh, for their intended use, which is for vehicle traffic? Thank you for that question, Commissioner Musich. Um, I well, uh, I, I have an initial answer, and then I, I suppose I would turn it over to the superintendent as well as he, if he has anything to add. Um, you know, as long as there's guidance for social distancing, I think that there's need for additional space uh, that if the park board can provide it uh, so that people are not crammed into six-foot-wide sidewalk spaces. Um, uh, I also... So essentially, we'll continue to do this until we either no longer need to social distance as a community or we run out of money? Um, again, I, I would say, you know, from my perspective, if we could continue it 
while there is the guidance to have a, the social distancing that we are currently um, being provided guidance for, I think that that is the way to go. I'm also sensitive to the cost, and I think that Commissioner Bourne's uh, amendment um, kind of sets a threshold there, and we can begin to set uh, precedent uh, or set, set expectations and uh, hopefully begin to adapt um, to a different setup once uh, the, the funds are expired uh, at that point. But Superintendent, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, no, President Kogel, Commissioner Musich, I think it's a, it's a good question. I know Commissioner and President Kogel, I think you articulated an uh, understanding of this. And, and I think uh, there's no question that the, um, the cost is absolutely uh, a concern. Like my recommendation coming in here is that, you know, when we're talking about this as we're looking at budget, um, it's, an, it's, it's a, a large cost. It's a, it's a big cost for this organization. Um, and the decision the board makes to give us guidance and direction on what to do and how to extend is really the board's decision. But then there's impacts on the back end of it. If we put the money forward for closures, then there's, um, there's cost to other decisions we have to make um, on the other end of that. And what does that mean? So cost is absolutely um, um, a concern and it's something that uh, um, we have to be able to acknowledge as we are right now looking at the cost that it, that's in front of us. Um, there's a, there is absolutely a will from uh, residents and from people that they would love to have this extend further. Um, I've had all sorts of conversations about going into, um, I've said into, the, into September and um, ultimately again, it's the board's decision on the guidance and what you want us to do and what is the, of the will of the board um, to do this and to move forward with it. Um, but the cost is, is a real, um, it, it's a real challenge and, and it's significant. And so, um, again, if the board is, is making the decision and would like to continue, then again, we have to look at the back end of it and the cost, and then we have to present that to the board and the board then gives us guidance in what to do. So, um, there's no clear answer at this point what the end date is, but absolutely cost is, um, a real uh, concern. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I agree that we're likely going to have to extend this past June 7th, so I, so I think I'd be able to support the amendment. Um, but I would ask that we receive an update um, from staff, particularly around how the parkways are being used, what sort of issues they're seeing um, out in the system, and any sort of changes that are recommended to enhance safety and encourage more social distancing as we continue, um, if we're not going to be checking in on a monthly basis about continuing uh, these closures. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Um, Commissioner Bourne for the second time. I just don't think I lowered my hand, I, or my hand's not up. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Forney. Thank you, President Colquell. Um I have no problem with the amendment, but I think that we're, we might be losing sight of what the resolution is asking, and that's not necessarily the 250, but it's more aligning with the, um, emergency powers that we've given to the superintendent through June 7th. Um, I think if I hear what people are saying is that more than likely this is all going to go beyond June 7th. So the next question is going to be, should we be talking about extending the emergency powers of the superintendent? So I, whatever I, I feel is that we've got two, two conversations happening here. I am totally fine with the amendment but I think that we need to understand, you know, are we putting the cart before the horse? And um, I, I'd like to support the resolution and I'm perfectly happy to support the amendment. But <laughs> is it realistic that we need to extend um, the June 7th of the emergency powers for our superintendent? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner Forney, for that question. Um, as, as I read the... <laughs> resolution we are extends as extending all current parkway closures through June 7th um, 
unless I'm mistaken, with Commissioner Forney or with Commissioner Bourne's amendment, uh, the direction was to extend those same parkway closures <coughs> until the dollars that are allocated uh, couldn't support those closures anymore. And it would be up to staff to determine that length of time and then announce a date. Is that uh, a fair understanding? <coughs> That's correct. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bourne. Um, and then I guess I would ask the superintendent and assistant superintendent whether or not there's any lack of clarity there. Is that a clear understanding? Um, President Cogill, uh, yes, it's clear. Um, assistant Superintendent Schroeder, uh, Question was asked, are you also um, clear on this? Uh, President Cogill and uh, Superintendent Bangora, we're clear on this. And in fact, we're taking steps already uh, to be bidding an extension of this uh, that can be put in place um, at any time. We'll probably have documents out this week. Um, so we'll be looking to see if we can gain some advantage even beyond the current pricing discount that we have. <laughs> and and mm -hmm. having, having an upper limit uh, actually provides us with the budget that we're typically used to working with as we procure improvements in the park system. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent and Assistant Superintendent. Um, seeing no other hands raised, I will uh, ask the Secretary to take a roll on the amendment, Commissioner Bourne's amendment to the resolution. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Abstain. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Abstain. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have seven ayes to abstain. Uh, that uh, amendment carries now to the main uh, resolution. Commissioner Meyer. President Cogill. Yeah. Commissioner Meyer. I'd like to move. I'd like to move the amendment that I read earlier. I'll read it again. Uh, resolved for the duration that parkways are temporary, temporarily closed to vehicle access uh, due to the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, the Board of Commissioners directs staff to designate all off-street sidewalk and bike lanes on the affected parkways to pedestrians and to designate the portion of roadway closed to vehicles to cycling, skateboarding, roller relating as soon as this shift can be adequately communicated to the public. Commissioner Meyer has made a uh, uh, Motion uh, for an amendment. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, the motion has been moved and seconded. Uh, I'll ask the commissioner to, to, I know you spoke, but if you wanted to say anything else to your amendment. Um, no, I mean, I, I do think we need to, to pick one direction or the other. We either need to really double down on the, the, the path that staff started out on and uh, really do an education campaign and uh, I don't know what, but um, either that or we, or we need to, to change it. And I feel that we should change it. Uh, I think this is more intuitive distribution. Um, so yeah, um, I just encourage commissioners to go for it. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer, Commissioner Musich, followed by Commissioner Forney. Thank you. Uh, following up on the comments I made earlier about people that have reached out to me that are um, that, have, that have suppressed immune systems, that uh, have disabled family members that really only feel safe using the parks at all because they have so much pavement to maneuver on on the parkway as pedestrians, I just can't support this um, amendment. 
Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Commissioner Forney. Um, thank you, um, President Cogill. Um, I too will not be supporting this. Um, I, I understand that it seems counterintuitive, but I think really the number one reason why the roadways were suggested is that there's more physical width there and that we were trying to allow space for pedestrians. We're not trying to encourage necessarily biking. We're not necessarily encouraging skateboarding. We were talking about pedestrians and that's what we were trying to accomplish. Um, and like I say, you know, talking with so many council members, talking to, you know, constituents and everything, the one thing that they were consistent is, please don't keep changing things up, you know, keep it, you know, so is it just strong communication we need as far as this is for this and that is for that? That I really would like to um, encourage people. How many times can I say it? The other thing I can say is our signs, I appreciate them, but they're broken. I had to fish one out of the, the shore of uh, Makaska, you know, yesterday. So it, we need another means to be able to communicate um, what is the appropriate use for each path, roadway. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Forney, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Um, I'm also pretty skeptical of the amendment while I understand the intent. Um, the, if we were to I think I have a question for lobbyist Rice. If we were to take the grand rounds out of circulation for vehicles, do we either directly or indirectly receive any funding um, from car and fuel taxes to support the grand rounds? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Warren, um, no, I don't believe there's any. A, Brian, you have a really bad connection. Um, is this better? Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, to Commissioner Bourne's question, yeah. I, I'm not aware of any regular uh, funding that we get for parkways like the city would get for its uh, state aid streets. Um, on occasion, we've gotten grants from the Met Council to make some uh, parkway improvements. Um, I know that there were uh, state funds that were put in on the West River Road, um, and uh, there there may be some restrictions on that on whether or not you could uh, permanently remove those from uh, the uh, the system or have to pay that money back. I think it's a matter we'd have to research. Um, at this point. Um, all of these resolutions were tied to with the executive order of Governor Walls, with the exception of uh, the one that the board decided to extend to June 7th. It sounds like the way this resolution has evolved, you're, um, I, I haven't exactly seen the language. You may, you may be going further than uh, some of the authorities that you've had. Um, with this 250,000. I think you're just going to, the, the long and short is I think you're going to need to research the question. I don't think that's before the body now. I haven't heard anyone say they're closing the parkways permanently. No, uh, no, but I, I just, where this conversation, a lot of the notes that I've been getting from constituents is let's shut them down permanently or let's shut them down until there is an event that we have no idea when and how to predict. Um, so I just want to make sure that there is no argument that folks can make that vehicle you, vehicle fees and taxes are paying for the grand round. So it sounds like I'm hearing you affirm that that is not the case. Um, well, let me clarify that. I, I'm not aware of any annual funding that goes into our park system. I did say I know there's been capital dollars that were contributed okay. to the creation of certain parts of the system, and it may be as a term of accepting the grant, the board committed that they would keep the roads open to traffic, and if you don't, you may have to repay those funds. I don't know that answer, but I'm saying I, I have a vague uh, 
recollection that we have had capital grants for a parkway, which was a vehicular parkway, not a uh, bicycle parkway or a walkway. I'll, I'll take your recollection. Uh, the so again, I, I I just wouldn't be supportive of this amendment for um, not just what, uh, not what I'm talking about right here, but just for the points that Commissioner Musich and Commissioner Forney both expressed that this really is allowed is to intended for pedestrian pedestrians to spread out, um, and for those folks that that is the closest park for them to walk to. Um, what are we doing, Superintendent, or maybe Chief Ohado, if he's on the line, what are we doing in terms of enforcement of uh, making sure, like, that's another series of emails and phone calls that I've been getting, and I think that there were some open time speakers tonight um, about the dangerous conditions and, the fo like, what are we doing for enforcement to keep the parkway for pedestrians? Uh, President Gill, uh, Commissioner Bourne, um, we've been more more than more than often at this point. We're relying on uh, the ambassador program that's out in the uh, in the uh, parkways. But again, we're limited by the number of people we can actually place at times in some of our busiest areas, and that could diminish. Going back to what Commissioner Musius Mush was saying, is that as we start to look at our programming and uh, uh, activation in our parks. Uh, and our different things that we're doing, it's going to be less uh, ambassadors probably out in our areas. From an enforcement standpoint, we haven't, uh, and Chief Ohado can step near, but we we haven't been um, enforcing like ticketing or doing those kind of things. And again, I will defer to Chief Ohado, but I have not, um, we have not given direction to go and start to uh, ticket people and, and cite them like we wouldn't go to, you know, uh, basketball courts and, and, and whenever officers respond in that sense, that would be uh, it wouldn't be good. So um, if Chief Ohad was on, I don't know if he's had any uh, direct responses, but we haven't, I have not said enforce or go and um, ticket or stop people if they're in the wrong direction. Um, that has not been the direction that we have gone at this point. Um, if Chief Ohad, are you on, on the line, Chief? I am here, sir. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, Chief, I, I just need like a one word answer not to not to I, I want to hear more from you but we have not issued a single ticket uh, it, we have not issued a single ticket for a violation on the uh, for a bicycle via violation on pedestrian uh, parkways correct president Togill and commissioner Bourne, that is correct and I don't believe in the current configuration that it could be enforceable Okay, the I I think there would be a mechanism to uh, to the folks that are interested in extending this beyond beyond the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They're again going to some targeted enforcement. I think that there would be a mechanism to continue this quite a bit longer if we looked at a uh, if we looked at citations for folks that are on wheels in the pedestrian area. Hmm. President Kogil and, and Commissioner Borton, as I said, the way that the traffic configuration is established right now, I, I don't believe is legally enforceable for us to write people tickets who are riding their bikes on the parkway. The, the signage that we have is not um, standardized. It doesn't meet the legal requirements. Um, the intended purpose of the parkway uh, is not how it's being used right now. I just don't, I, I don't believe from a law enforcement perspective that, that the current configuration would be enforceable for criminal penalties. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Um, not seeing any other hands raised um, on the amendment of oh, Commissioner, Commissioner French. French has his hand raised. Uh, 
Uh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, not pretty, that threw me off. Uh, <laughs> oh, all right. Sorry. Uh, we we talked about <laughs> talked about the numbers of uh, staff out working. Uh, have we have we recruited staff from other parts of the park board as people who don't normally work inside our parks? Maybe people from planning or such to maybe do ambassador work. Uh, can we? Is there a way to do that so we have more ambassadors out actually doing work? Is that a possibility, Commissioner French? Could you keep your comments to the to the amend the well, resolution? This, well, this 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 would be we have extra workers to do some of the, to do some of the stuff that we're asking people to do. So that's why I'm asking that we'd actually have more ambassadors out. It, has that been discussed about pulling people from different parts of the park board to to provide more ambassador and more education? Uh, President Cogill and Commissioner French, um, currently the, the number of staff we have doing the work right now has gone across the organization in all areas where we wanted to find meaningful work. And for those that, um, for instance, the buildings are closed, we're using our staff that are um, typically in the buildings, but now they're doing this work because of the building closures. As we start to scale back that, of course, we start to be programming back in our centers or um, outside. So. We're using staff that are right now, this is typically their work that they would do and within their job assignment. Um, and we've gone across the organization to fill that need with our ambassadors out in the field. So we have not discussed it from planning because planning is doing uh, their work they do every day. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, we've looked across all the people we pulled at this time currently do the work that's the ambassador are ones like from the, um, Media Outreach Department or from our Youth and Adult Athletics, from our rec centers. Um, so we're using the staff that we currently have within their job scope and they're doing uh, the work around that right now as far as the ambassador work. I wasn't trying to pick up my actor say, but I want what I want no, no, to I understand. I, I just wanted to make are we going across the across the, the whole entire park board to make sure because I heard you say that and I know Commissioner uh Severson also said that there's I don't see a lot of ambassadors out there when I go out there. I think we can use more. I think the education mm -hmm. can, can be greater. So, and, and okay. that's why I brought that point up, President Colo. Thank you, Commissioner French. Thank you. Seeing, seeing no other comments, uh, I'm not seeing any other hands on the amendment, uh, which was Commissioner Meyer's amendment. So I'll ask the secretary to please take the role on Commissioner Meyer's Amendment. Commissioner Bourne. No. Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Severson. No. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Yes. Aye. Commissioner French. No. Commissioner Forney. No. Vice President Vita. No. President Kogil. Aye. You have three ayes, six nays. Uh, the amendment uh, fails, Commissioner Meyer. Yes, I have one other amendment I'd like to move. Um, this is in order to actually you know, give staff direction on, on reducing the cost as much as possible. So I'm taking this language directly from the staff report. Um, so in order to reduce signage and barrier costs, uh, the Board of Commissioners directs staff to, and there'd be bullet, three, three separate bullet points. First bullet point is uh, fully closed Cedar Lake Parkway. Second is fully closed East Padema Costca, comma, pending communication with key property owners. And the third bullet point is adopt nearly full closure of West River Parkway, which, um, I, again, I understand would need to exclude between 27th and, and Lake. But um, yeah, that would uh, save, I think, about $20,000. Uh, the resolution has been moved. Is there a second? 
Resolution has been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. So I found this resolution a bit confusing. I, I thought that the way that it was initially written was calling for these changes, the full closure of Cedar Lake Parkway, the full closure of East Bede Macasa, pending communication with the property owners, and the nearly full closure of West River Parkway. Was that not the intention when this was brought forward? President Coco and Commissioner Musich, in order to take advantage of the cost savings we were finding um, as we uh, walked through the, the unit prices with uh, warning lights or vendor, um, it was the intention that we would be extending this until June 7th to get a discount to begin with and then looking at reconfigurations to get the maximum uh, value from the dollars that we're spending. Okay, so this amendment is unnecessary as currently written. President Cogill and, and Commissioner Musich, I still think it's incumbent upon staff to create the best possible closures now with the dollars that were allocated, and we'll keep, we'll keep pursuing that um, through this process we're going through with the bidding uh, that, that we're actually in process with now. Okay, so you don't need us to, to amend this resolution to allow you to achieve cost savings by modifying the existing closures. President Kova, Christian Musich, we may find other closures or other modifications that also save us money. We have a work group that's been studying this, and this was their, this was part of the initial uh, recommendation. We may find other opportunities to affect some savings. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to request the, the motion maker withdraw this motion since it's all right, the, the amendment that is being requested is already being achieved through the um, motion on the table. Commissioner Meyer. Um, so I didn't read the amend the original resolution that way because the original resolution makes reference um, to uh, the district commissioners uh, needing to consent to each of these. So I think that this would just settle it, things for staff, um, you know, to have clear board direction uh, that the board would like you to proceed with fully closing these three locations as much as possible. Um, okay. So you you'd know, like to I keep the right. keep the resolution or the amendment? Yeah, I will. I will proceed with with keeping it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Musich for the second time. So, can I get some staff clarification around whether or not this new resolution eliminates the? Um, consent of district commissioners component of our previous resolution. President Kogel, uh, Commissioner Musich, um, I guess I would have to defer to legal counsel to see how one resolution may or may not um, override another. Council Rice. Council Rice. Um, thank you. Um, Commissioner, I, since these amendments haven't been uh, presented to me, um, I guess I'll have to defer my legal opinion until I actually see what's produced tonight. Um, I, I would say that no, that the action of the board to uh, require the um, consent of the president uh, with the agreement of the local district commissioner would stay in effect. Okay, thank you. It, until the $250,000 runs out, which is an interesting idea in itself. Right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, um, thank you, Council, and thank you, Commissioner Musich. I'm seeing no other questions or comments. Um, I, I, I will be looking for some clarity uh, uh, after this is passed on, on that. Um, discrepancy considering that the resolution says extending all current parkway closures through June 7th um, which will be amended to through that period for the ex exhaustion of $250,000 um, I think I'll, I'll withdraw the motion given what council has just said I don't want to cause unnecessary confusion okay I, I guess okay. I'll just add, add the comment that I, I hope staff proceeds with those three recommend recommendations that they had in the staff report to bring the cost down as much as possible. 
Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Um, Commissioner Bourne, this is for the second time on the main motion. Um, maybe just a point of clarification. I believe it's to the main motion. Um, it, the language is pretty clear that this is extending all current parkway closures through June 7th. So that, and I guess how I would look at it is I plan on voting for this or through the exhaustion of the closures. And that to me would seem to be my consent on the closures in the sixth district. And I, I, I just, I, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of confusion on the language of that resolution. It's, it's extending the current parkway closures. Thank, thank you for that point of clarification, Commissioner Bourne, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Cogill. Uh, so I would just like some clarification from staff on what a nearly full closure of West River Parkway means. Uh, does that mean that the um, retirees living in Beckettwood now have to move a barricade to go down West River Road to get out of their homes? Um, does that mean that the lock and dam now needs to move a barricade to be able to get into their workplace? Um, help me understand what a nearly full closure of West River Parkway looks like in the fifth district. President Kogo, Commissioner Musich, um, a nearly full closure would provide, would, would continue to provide access to residential uses, you have residential properties whose driveways are fronting on the parkway. And where we could get to, where we could get to full closure, where there are no driveways or access needs to private properties, we would do so. Um, we can be speaking with the, um, and we, I, I can't remember what Mr. Stenzel uh, told me about the lock and dam. They, I think he said that they have uh, two uh, employees who are basically on that site continuously all day during their shift, and they could move and uh, drive past the barrier um, so that we could gain a full closure, and they would be moving through there essentially twice a day, once to get in, once to get out. So there would be a possibility of uh, providing them access without providing a, 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 a designated lane for their limited number of trips. So we would keep one lane open for the blocks that allow access to the residential that is correct. Um, properties along the parkway. That's correct. And then it would expand to full road closure once you're past the earliest opportunity for those vehicles to depart the parkway. Correct and much shorter than what I've okay. Okay. Um, and then the other question I had was about Nokomis Parkway. Initially, I was notified that um, West Lake Nokomis Parkway would be closed from 54th Street to Cedar Avenue, um, and the only portion of the parkway of West Lake Nokomis Parkway that would remain open was the portion where homes are immediately on the parkway. Uh, but I don't see that on this list. Is that also being considered? as a cost savings? Mr. Mish, we've, we've talked about it. I don't think we came to a conclusion on it. Okay. When you do, will I be notified <laughs> um, that, that it's happening? President Kogo, Commissioner Musich, uh, staff, um, staff makes other changes. Um, we want to make certain commissioners are aware of what's going on, and so we will communicate any further changes with commissioners before they're made and, and make certain that the, the word can be spread before we send out a gov delivery on any changes. Okay. Thank you very much. I thank, appreciate the thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Commissioner Forney, for the second time. Thank you, President Hogill. Um, my apologies for maybe not reading the resolution um, clearly. Um, I wasn't aware of the additional potential closures. Sorry, my, um, my bad. But um, in talking, as I indicated to uh, council members, um, The detours are not being conveyed, and that I think is something we need to work. I, I don't know signage, whatever, um, working with the city. But um, I know particularly around Cedar and Isles, that is a. I mean, there are so few routes to get through in that area. Um, I know myself. You know, <laughs> I have very few um, accesses and entrances 
to, you know, my community being on a one-way street. So I, I, I'm just really concerned about now changing up again. So uh, that was, like I say, the clearest thing I got from all the council members is please try to minimize changes. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Forney. Seeing no other hands raised, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on the resolution 2020-202 with the amendment. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Abstain. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Abstain. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have seven ayes to abstain. That carries. Moving on to uh, new business, we do have the 2019 annual report and accomplishments presentation. Um, I'll turn it over to the superintendent. Um, All right. Thank you, President Cogill and commissioners. Um, for time purposes, I will try to be efficient as possible to uh, work way through this, but these are um, great information and uh, we want to share with you um, not only the annual report for our accomplishments and review some of our milestones. Um, I'll wait for the uh, presentation to come back up here and then I'll get started. Thank you. So, um, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to really provide um, an overview of, of our accomplishments, many of our accomplishments in 2019. Um, we had originally planned to um, really do this early in the spring, but obviously with the focus of um, COVID-19, it was delayed. And so again, um, it's in front of you tonight and um, we're just thankful for that, that we can provide this uh, at this time. Um, this presentation will, or will be comprised of three sections. The first section, which I will present, uh, is around the 2019 strategic direction and performance goals. Um, which were included uh, in the 2020 budget book and approved by the board last December. Uh, the next section uh, is the 2019 annual report, and I've asked uh, Director uh, Don Summers to present an overview of the report. And the last section is a quick overview of some of the key accomplishments that were not uh, included in the strategic directions, performance goal accomplishments, or annual report. So uh, next slide, please. So um, last summer, um, the board uh, developed the performance goals um, for myself and the organization. And I'm really proud to say that we, of course, met the, we met those established 2019 milestones. Um, I'm gonna go through this section relatively quickly, so I will try to move fast through it, focusing really on the accomplishments in the areas. And so um, that way we can continue to move on. So really, of course, um, the first Strategic Direction A was investing in youth, and the 2019 accomplishments um, were established a full service community school at Bethune Elementary. We completed the youth line program evaluation, we structured management of youth line programs, and added two full time youth program specialists. And the last thing, we increased funding and established the Walt Dietzick Recreation Innovation Fund. Next slide. Um, Section A, invest in youth, performance goal A2. Um, the accomplishments that we, of course, did there was we completed the baseline work for youth employment programs. We funded in the hiring of 30 additional youth through team teamwork, and we funded the hiring of 16 additional youth through, the co through one conservation core crew that will begin work in 2020. Next slide, please. Um, These are goal B, uh, we're to be financially sustainable. Um, and of course, um, uh, we advise the commissioners of, of a balanced, equitable annual budget solution through 2022 and required 
uh, levels of fund reserves and established by the NPW financial management policies with flexibility during periods of recession. So 2019 accomplishments for B1, we adjusted the 2020 budget process to better align with the city to improve communication and data sharing between the MPRB and the city. The financial outlook for the first time included impacts on operations due uh, to service delivery needs of a new residential areas that were traditionally non-residential in support of the city's growth patterns, including the Commons Park and maintaining service delivery levels for other system development, improvements and expansion. The last one we had here was a new process implemented for budget requests, linking the request to, to the strategic direction and performance goals during the board budget retreat. Uh, commissioners informally prioritized the request. Funding strategies were discussed for requests that received the most support from the commissioners and the board identified priorities that should move forward into the conversations. Uh, sorry, last speaker. Uh, whoops, my apology. Um, uh, sorry, next slide. Um, strategic direction B, be financially sustainable. Um, the 2019 accomplishments for B2. Uh, we drafted the Closing the Gap, Investing in Youth Report to define gap in recreation programs and services. And then we finalized Closing the Gap Report, completing the master plan to determine long-term funding needs. Update, we completed two service area master plans and six regional parkland trail master plans. And we also received data, uh, citywide data on co uh, community performance and funding sources. Next slide, please. Um, strategic uh, Direction B, um, we uh, accomplished, of course, we presented options for inclusion of underdeveloped parks in MPP 20 to Board of Commissioners. We implemented, we're implementing current year CIP projects and we're exploring with city options for procurement based on current construction market condi conditions. Next slide, please. And Strategic Direction C, Protect the Environment. And this, of course, is to reduce the MPRB's carbon footprint by 10% and establish new targets by 2022. Uh, the accomplishments for C1 uh, was we completed the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board's first carbon accounting report in collaboration with the University of Minnesota, Centers for Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy. Next, next slide, please. And uh, we established Lake Natural Area Land and Urban Forest Management Plans that recommend sustainable and equitable service levels for 2022. The accomplishments for C2, we implemented operational inspections for playgrounds and recreation centers that captures the data digitally and allows for weekly analysis. We developed the framework for an urban forest management plan that will make recommended sustainable and equitable service levels. And we initiated a pilot program for mobile technology that expands tracking of forestry work and data collection to the digital platform. Next slide. And uh, engage communities of power, strategic direction uh, uh, B, uh, engage communities of power. Um, and it, so there we uh, did determining project changes in race, ethnicity, and gender for Minneapolis working age population, tracking current demographics of MPRB workforce, and continuing organization wide ADA, gender inclusion, and race equity training. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also, uh, performance goal, of course, is to distribute, uh, demonstrate that participants engaged through the community engagement policy to reflect the demographics of the communities served by the program, service, and or project to support equitable delivery of programs, service, and or projects through 2022. So the accomplishments, NPRB comprehensive plan, uh, parks for all summer of engagement, uh, we continued development of plans using summer engagement. Update, we updated the community engagement policy aimed at, broad, at broadening engagement across all of MPRB. And we seeded CACs for two projects reflecting diversity characteristics of the updated community engagement plan. Next slide, please. For its goal D3, track and report progress on the uh, in implement actions set in community driven park and recreational plans service area plans, regional park plans, master plans, requests, et cetera. Our accomplishments, we implemented master plan tracking relative to capital improvements. 
We assign staff as master plan champions to ensure alignment of master plans with implementing capitals and rehabilitation projects. We identified alternative project delivery methods with city, applic uh, city applicable to some capital projects. And we adjusted the CIP organization to reflect equity and expenditures relative to park site and master plan direction. Uh, next slide, please. And with that, um, I am going to turn this over to uh, Director uh, Don Summers to walk through the Superintendent's 2019 Annual Report. And thank you for uh, your patience on the first section. I know it's been that you've all seen it, but I wanted just to touch base on it again. So thank you for your time and uh, I'll turn it over to Don Summers. Don, are you there? I was wondering if I had to have both mics off so, or on. There you go. So again, thank you, Superintendent Bangora, um, President Cogill, Commissioners, happy to present this report. I too will try to be concise in my remarks as we move through this given the time of night. Um, as Superintendent Bangora mentioned, this was initially uh, planned for earlier this spring. We actually received delivery of the print copies of the end report the, the Monday of the stay-at-home order. So we um, are waiting to mail those out, and you'll all get a copy, um, as will many others. But I'm going to walk through the report quickly here. Um, it's always a pleasure to do this every year. It's always remarkable to me to look back and um, really look at what we did in any given year, and, and the 2019 was no different. So. As in past year, the annual report really looks at reviewing the highlights and major accomplishments that the organization did. The whole report is designed around the 2007-2020 comprehensive plan. It's been that way for a number of years. Obviously, as we move into a new comprehensive plan, the, the format and design and, and focus of the report will change. But this is really our last year that is still following the accomplishments as outlined in the 2007 and 2020 report. Um, as of a couple years ago, when the, when the board developed new strategic actions, uh, the report also tries to really reflect those in the remarks it's made. So, and of course, our mission. Uh, next slide, please. So, the report is broken into. Uh, we've got a superintendent's message. His message really focuses on the 2019 work around the, the organization did around the strategic directions. We've got the first really two opening pages really focus on the work done by the Parks for All with reference to really the amazing work done by the youth design team, some of the, the engagement efforts through community collaborators, some of the use of technology well before um, a national pandemic of online use on screen and rec centers. You've all seen the, the boxes out in our sites to, to get ideas and then, of course, the advisory committee. So a lot of work done around uh, it really intensive community engagement um, as, they, as they look to how they're going to develop and pursue and write the, the Parks for All uh, comp plan for the next 10 years. Uh, you had a pr really extensive, wonderful update by uh, Director Wiseman earlier this evening on the MPP 20 highlights. The end report has a, a sidebar that just really captures some of the data around um, some key numbers kind of fun facts, if you will, around what we've done for capital investments, rehab, increased maintenance, and how we continue to use the equity ranking criteria. And then we drive them all to the, um, the MPP 20 report that uh, we knew would be available online as well. We also talk about the, the close in the back gap. That, that was a really big initiative last year. There was a lot of um, effort into how we uh, are looking at how we're going to address um, investing in youth within Minneapolis and how we're going to, um, the need for funding for those youth investments and really the introduction of the six pillars of critical programming uh, as a way to address the, the programmatic and service delivery for youth in Minneapolis. And then uh, you're all familiar with the 2019 citywide survey that was done, and there's a, a sidebar column just really kind of highlighting some of the key findings, and the key findings, as you all know, really confirm the broad support for the organization and the services and the work that we do. So next slide, please. After those introductory pages, as I mentioned before, the annual report is really broken into each of the, the vision areas, and then there's a section on values. The first vision area is 
the fact that you know we we have a vision for urban forest natural areas and waters that endure and captivate so the this is again a two page spread really chock full of all kinds of really great things so what I've done is just really highlighted some of the the, the really new initiatives that were first for us last year the e, you know we do a lot of work around zebra muzzles and um, AIS inspections and really trying to protect our lakes and as part of that, they did their first eDNA testing, um, which was a, a DNA sampling for zebra mussels, and we were really thrilled that none were discovered. Uh, at Worth Lake, we, they discovered the first, I, I'm hoping I'm saying this right, but I think it's that bladder wart plant. Uh, first time it was discovered in the lake, and what the significance of that is it's a pretty unusual plant, and it's the first time it was discovered in one of our lakes, and it's really an indicator of high water quality, which again, I think just reflects the, the work that our environmental um, stewardship division does and our, our environmental, man, environmental management staff. One of, the, one of the funny things I learned uh, when working on the report with the bladder wart is it's, it's actually, and I'm not, I'm not going to say it right, but it's actually a, uh, it's an unusual plant. It is, uh, and I have to look this up, it's, um, it's, a, it, it's actually a carnivorous plant species. It has, it has small bladders or stomachs and that it uses a trap and digest microscopic place. So not only does it have a cool name, but it, uh, I, was, I was intrigued by that. Anyways, moving along. Shoreline restoration at Nokomis, again, almost 5,000 linear feet, were uh, restored along the north, northeastern shore. They launched environmental stewardship, launched new mobile, mobile nature education stations so they could travel throughout the park system to various Parks with a portable cart offering fun nature art activities. Um, last year was our 25th anniversary of Earth Day. They had a record number of sites, an amazing number of volunteers, and collected almost 9,000 pounds of garbage um, out of the parks. There's a lot of notes in the, these two pages, really reflecting the important ongoing work. Um, tree planting, uh, 9,000 trees, ash canopy replacement, AIS inspections, invasive species. And again, the wonderful environmental education that continues to happen in the parks uh, all the time through events and programs. Next slide, please. Recreation that inspires personal growth, healthy lifestyles, and a sense of community. Again, we've got an amazing recreation division that does really amazing work in our community, uh, providing services to uh, um, park users of all ages and all interest. And, uh, so this just highlights again some of these the new things that um, came out the uh, Mia exhibit. There was actually artwork produced in parks all over the summer through our partnership with Mia. And what was really exciting is that part of the program included an exhibit of that artwork done by kids in our in our parks and our rec centers that was showcased at Mia last uh, fall in one of their galleries. As uh, Superintendent Van Gogh already mentioned. It was uh, adding new funding and creating the Walt Music Fund to pilot new programs that really range from biking to lifelong leisure skills and all kinds of wonderful things in between. The community garden program was launched um, and established new places in the parks. We had our first golf summit. Uh, again, over 300 golfers signed up and took advantage of uh, leaks and purchase passes and took in more than $60,000 on our first attempt. We started programming at the Commons uh, before it was Hours. We were in partnership of, of, with the lawsuit, and we launched a number of new programs. And uh, the, the summer really ended with a really amazing uh, youth live music festival on, on the grounds that was really fun to, to watch. Final Four Legacy um, happened, and as a result of that, we had North Commons receive a, a wonderful renovated gym and new teen room. I think a lot of you have seen that. It's a great addition to uh, the north side in that particular park. And then again, just a lot of really important ongoing work related to the programs and leagues and team teamwork of events that happen all the time and uh, in, in, our, in our parks by a lot of dedicated staff. Next slide, please. So, uh, Director uh, uh, Summers, I, if, we could, if, we could, if we could maybe cut this part short unless there's any, uh, re uh, it is time being 10 o'clock unless there's any major concerns from other commissioners. I think folks can check out the annual report on their, their own time. Uh, though I, I am seeing maybe Commissioner Musich has a question. She does want the rest of this. 
Commissioner Musich? I don't I don't want the rest of this. Okay. Thanks for asking. Thanks. I, I, yeah, I think <laughs> um, we should move what, forward given the fact that we have two more committees. Yeah. Thanks. Really, I'm just wondering if we'll be distributing these to the little free libraries that are located across the system since the rec centers are closed and we typically do have copies of this available for people to read at those locations. That is a wonderful suggestion and I will I will look into how we can make that happen. Sweet, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Director Summers. Uh, uh, Superintendent, do you have any uh, anything else you'd like to add on this item? Yeah, President, President Gogil, um, we did have uh, at the end of this presentation was um, accomplishments that were not in the strategic direction that we wanted to share, but, but because of time and it's um, getting late, um, this is uh, probably what five PowerPoint slides with information specifically around each department, superintendent's office, communication and marketing. It gives context to the work that we have done above and beyond the strategic goals and um, and, uh, and and performance uh, performance goals. So, if if you would like, uh, we could share this with the board, not at tonight's meeting, and walk and read through all of it and. Uh, just share it like we would with the annual um, report and get this all the commissioners so you have an opportunity to read through it. That way I don't have to be a talking head here for 15 minutes. Um, I would love to be able to read it, but again, I, I defer to you, President Kogel, if you sure. want to hear this or we can share it through uh, I, communication. I appreciate that, Superintendent, and I, I am I'm interested in, in studying um, all aspects of that. I Unless I'm seeing anything from commissioners who would like to have that report at this time? I, I think that it would be fair to say that that we'd be able to um, digest that information offline and, and follow up with any questions. I my my one comment on this is I, it's just amazing to see the work that was done in 2019, and I encourage commissioners to um, look at how uh, in, in such a detailed way staff and and our superintendent have been clear about uh, the directions that, that we've set for for performance measures and how they've been not just met but exceeded. Um, and, and to think also moving forward how we can um, build on those and, and improve. So um, I, I think in some ways with the detail of this, it, it's almost better to, to look at it one-on-one -on -one and read through the text and spend some time with it um, if you haven't already. Um, but I'll defer to any commissioners if they have any comments or they want more information at this time. All right, um, seeing none. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent, for the report. Um, moving on to our last item of business in the regular meeting, uh, petitions and communications. I'll start with uh, Commissioner Meyer. That's Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Kogel. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief because I'm pretty confident that the superintendent and all board members and the mayor have all reached out to Commissioner Steverson after he was the victim of an act of gun violence um, in the last uh, uh, in the last couple of days, and I know we're all we're all very we're all wishing him and his family and his neighboring community members um, some well wishes in this. I couldn't imagine how traumatic how traumatic that that event was, and I'm just fortunate that he and his family are physically okay, um, and him hope um, just really hopeful that. As, as a community, we can really take some some lessons and what you know the superintendent and the majority of the board has really been working on the last the last few years is that if there's not young people are going to find something to do, and if it's not with us, there's a lot of worse opportunities out there, and I I get really nervous about the amount of intellectual capital that we're putting into bike paths right now, um, and not addressing the true crises in our city. So uh, again, uh, Commissioner Severson, I'm I'm really I think the entire board is in unison on this. That we're all very sorry that this happened to you, um, and I'm looking forward to continue to work with you to make sure that our priorities are really in and around reducing youth violence and and in and in and around reducing youth violence 
even in these times to when our work is much harder. So uh, thank you, Commissioner Severson, for everything that you do. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, Commissioner Musich. I'll pass. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner French. Pass. Oops. Commissioner Hassan. I'll come back to. Oh, okay. Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Uh, Commissioner Severson. Uh, I, I appreciate that uh, coming from uh, Commissioner Bourne and, and and everyone else as well. And, and I'm going to pass up, up to this point. But thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Uh, Commissioner Forney. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Forney, Commissioner or Vice President Vita. Yeah. Thank you, Vice President Vita. Um, I will just say I echo uh, Commissioner Bourne's condolences, and uh, I look forward to working with all commissioners on the critical work of making sure that our parks are safely accessible for everybody, and that that during this time people have. Um, really the critical activities that are constructive that they can do in their par our park system. Um, I, I think that uh, guidance and wisdom uh, is, is really necessary right now and the more conversations we can have uh, about how to respond in this difficult time, the better. And um, So I appreciate all the conversation tonight and look forward to many more conversations on the, the slew of other uh, very important uh, issues facing us as we f figure out how people are using our public spaces and how we can make sure that they safely do so, um, no matter what uh, their interest is in, in our public system. Uh, so with that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn the regular meeting of the Park Board. So moved. Resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, been moved second. and seconded. I'll ask the Secretary to please take the roll in our I take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. <clears throat> Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. You have nine ayes. We're adjourned. I will now turn the hosting over to uh, Commissioner uh, Forney. Sorry. Continue, Commissioner Forney. <laughs> Thank you, President Kogil. I'd like to call the Administration and Finance Committee uh, to order. Would the Secretary please call the roll? Vice, Vice President Vita. President. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner French. Present. Vice Chair Hassan. Here. Chair Forney. Present. You have a I'll quorum. take a motion. I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So, so moved. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Um, oh, okay. excuse uh, me. <laughs> uh, Secretary, please call the roll on the approval of the agenda. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 18th, 2020. So moved. All those, um, would the secretary please call the roll on the approval of the minutes? Vice Chair Vita. Aye. 
Commissioner Usage. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. I'll take a motion to move resolution 2020-204. I'll move resolution 2020-204, a resolution approving a second amendment to lease agreement with Ventura Village for 868 square feet at Phillips Community Center, 2300 13th Avenue South, Minneapolis, Minnesota, at a rate of $9.99 per square foot annually for a one year term. Any discussion on the uh, resolution? Any presentation? I'm not seeing any hands up. So uh, will the secretary please call the roll on resolution 2020-204. Vice President Vita. Yes. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Commissioner French. <coughs> yes. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. Thank you. I will take a motion to move resolution 2020-205. I will move resolution 2020 205. It's a resolution approving amendment number two to professional services agreement number C 44285 with 10 by 10 LLC the to the 26th Avenue North Overlook and Shoreline Enhancement Project in the amount of $21,950 for a new contract total of $213,083 and approval of Above the Falls Regional Park funding in the amount of $149,000. $149,680. Um, any need for discussion? Any questions? Not seeing any hands. Um, will the secretary please call the roll on resolution 2020-205? Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> the Secretary, please call the roll on the adjournment. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. We are adjourned. And we'll now pass then the... Um, you can do it. Now? Hover over Chris. Yep. <laughs> and then select, um, make him yep. go to more. Oh, you got it? Yep, cool. exactly. So uh, Chris is now the host. Nice Time work, being Meg. 1013. Excuse me. Time being 1013, I call to order the planning committee. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice Chair v or Vice President Vita. Present. Commissioner French. Here. President Cogill. Here. Vice Chair Forney. Here. Chair Meyer. Here. You have a quorum. I would entertain the approval of the agenda with two modifications that staff have recommended. Uh, they have re recommended moving 2020-207 because it turns out it's not necessary uh, for an encroachment permit for that. And they have also recommended removing 2020-211 because the agreement has been modified and is not yet ready for it. Um, so with those two uh, Eliminations, uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. 
Second. Or, I guess Secretary, we'll Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Yes, here. Aye. Sorry. <laughs> President Kogia. President Kogia. Uh, aye, here. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. Is there a motion to approve the agenda of Wednesday, March 18th, 2020? Oh. Secretary, please call the roll. Uh, 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 Chair Meyer, do you mean the minutes? Yeah. No. What did I say? I think you said agenda. The meeting. <laughs> oh, the minutes of, yes. The minutes of March 18th, 2020. And that was moved by um, Vice Chair Forney? Um, v -Town. Okay. I believe. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. President Kogan. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. Is there a motion for resolution 2020-206? A move resolution approving an encroachment permit for the use of 92 square feet of land in front of the subject property of 2388 West Lake of the Isles Parkway encroaching upon parkland at West Lake of the Isles Parkway within Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park and collecting appropriate fees associated with this encroachment. Thank you. Is there a new discussion on 2020-206? I, I would like a sh very, very short presentation just to, just to familiar, you know. Okay. Staff. Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, are you still on the call? Uh, Chair Meyer, I am, but this would be um, Christine Downey who will share some thoughts on this. Okay. I'm very impressed if she's still here. Are you still here, Christine? I see your name. I, I do too. But... Yes, I'm still here. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Secretary Ringo, you have the, um, on the transfer drive, there is a presentation that's under folder marked C. Downey. Yep, it's already up. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> All right, so um, this is sort of the run of the mill encroachment matter. Um, it is for a retaining wall located at 388 West Lake of the Isles Parkway. It's for 92 square feet. Um, you can flip to the second page. And it's basically on the west side of Lake of the Isles Parkway. You can second can flip to the third page. That's just another aerial map showing the location around the lake. You can flip to the next page. So the retaining wall, is my understanding, is, is almost as old as the home. And I believe the home was built back in the 1920s. And these are photos obviously taken before the snow had melted. <laughs> so you can flip to the next page. This is a site plan that's also looked, actually included in the um, packet for the resolution. It's pretty small, unfortunately. It's probably very hard to see, but you can flip to the next page and it's a, a zoomed in portion of the site plan to show you the portion that is the encroachment area. So you can see the length of the wall that is encroaching on parkland is basically about a little less than 85 feet in length. Um, so the total square footage is 92, so it's a little bit more than a foot that it's sticking out into parkland. Um, again, the retaining wall has been there almost as long as the house has been. <clears throat> but, but, but I'm sorry. Park, I'm sorry, but it, 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 that's parkland though, right? That, that one foot? That one foot, um, but as, as I said, it's been as long as the house has been there, and it's my understanding that the owners that are 
currently asking for the encroachment, uh, receive this encroachment, not through the, any fault of their own, but by buying the house. This, this wall has been there prior to them actually purchasing the home, I believe. Um, I think we do have the contractor and the present owner on the line, but if I could just, um, just explain. So to my understanding, the wall is made up of concrete blocks and there's a fa fa uh, facade or um, facing on it and it's crumbling and they just want to replace the facing on it. So <clears throat> in, in order to, be, to basically become compliant, it's an existing encroaching, encroachment, meaning that it's something that they, had, uh, they hadn't put there. They, um, it wasn't something that, that the encroachment was on something they, they created it. They had inherited it by purchasing the property. And so they're basically becoming compliant by paying for the encroachment by, you know, when they do the substantial modification by making improvement to the wall, um, they're basically asking the park board to make it legal. So um, it's taking out a little bit, like I said, maybe a little bit more than a foot into parkland. It's been there as long as about the house has been there. So I think that maybe one more slide I think I have on the, on the presentation. Actually, that's it. So, um, and that's calculated, and there's an encroachment fee that I believe is included in the resolution, um, and so they would pay that plus the administrative fee. So that is. Thank you, Christine. That was that was awesome. And, uh, the reason I asked that question was because we've had some pretty robust conversations on the diets about uh, selling parkland and who, who who's able to buy parkland, who's able to get encroachments from parkland, and it seems like we have another group of folks who a little bit more affluent, who have more access uh, to parkland. And so I'm just, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm asking uh, certain commissioners, what's the difference between this and other issues that have come before the park board as far as land that the park board owns that somebody else wants to use? So are you asking me or are the other commissioners? I, 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 either staff or probably Commissioner Meyer is probably the one I'm directing this question towards. You know, I don't have any comment on that. Thank so you. If, you if, if there's any further discussion, we can take that. Well, I was, I was, I was talking about, you know, the mosque and the curb cuts that they were asking for and why those were denied. And it seems like everybody else's, you know, request is getting approved. So I'm I'm just curious, what why why is it different? So I, that's okay. Thank you. If, I just wanted to have it. Okay. <laughs> is there any further discussion on the resolution? Seeing no hands raised, secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Vita. Aye. Commissioner French? No. President Cogill? Aye. Vice Chair Forney? Aye. Chair Meyer? Abstain. You have three ayes, one nay, one abstain. That carries. Is there a motion for resolution 2020-208? I'll move, um, Joy, okay, resolution concurring um, with the de minimis, excuse me, I get my glasses on, finding <laughs> by the Federal Highway Administration related to the West Broadway Avenue bridges and reconstruction project adjacent to and within Theater Worth Parkway and Victory Memorial Parkway. Thank you, are there any questions or discussion? Not seeing any hands raised, the secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commission Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. You have five ayes. That carries. Is there a motion for resolution 2020 209? 
I'd like to move resolution 2020-209, a resolution approving the concept plan for splash pad and site improvements at Victory Park. Thank you. Is there any discussion or questions? Not seeing any hands raised. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. That carries. Uh, is I'd, there like motion? To move, I'd like to move resolution 2020-210, a resolution granting temporary construction easements to the Minnesota Department of Transportation for bridge purposes in central Mississippi Riverfront Regional Park. Thank you. Is there any discussion on resolution 2020-2010? Seeing none, Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. That carries. I'd like, to, I'd like to move resolution 2020-211, a resolution no. of, no, 20, no. Oh, 212, okay. I'd like to move resolution 2020-212, a resolution granting amendment one to temporary construction easements to the city of Minneapolis for the 10th Avenue bridge purposes in central Mississippi Riverfront Regional Park. Thank you, is there any discussion? Seeing no hands raised, Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Be well, everybody. Be well. Good night. See have you a good evening. Weeks. Uh -huh. Thank you all. Thank you, President. Thanks, everybody. Bye.